Okay, hello YouTube. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about philosophy of gender with a focus on transgender issues. Um, so uh, I, I should say um, that I, I actually don't know a great deal about this particular topic. Um, uh, uh, for, for anybody who's uh, new to this channel, I, uh, my, my name is Kane Baker. I, I have a philosophy PhD. I focused on philosophy of science. Um, but um, uh, this particular topic, I'm fairly new to it. So uh, I'm joined by somebody uh, who has, uh, who's more aware of the uh, literature here. Um, and I will now turn it over to her and she can introduce herself. Um, <laughs> Does that work? <laughs> is that a, is that an acceptable introduction? <laughs> yes, it is. It's good. Okay. That's a good introduction. I like that. Okay. Well, and do you want to? Uh, okay, go ahead. You introduce yourself because <laughs> I'm I'm not going to try. I I'm not going to try to re-record this. I'm ter I'm terrible at introductions, and uh, I've just sorry. attempted to record the introduction like ten times. So. Um, I'm just going to keep this recording going, and all of this that I'm saying now is going out. So, <laughs> oh, this is actually going to be in yeah. it. Oh, no. This is going to be in it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, well, then uh, you've already heard my voice. So, hello. Uh, my name is Diana Luna. Um, I am an undergraduate student, and I study philosophy not as my major, but more as like my passion. Um, so I'm kind of an autodidact here, but uh, my work has been. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback, uh, posit excuse me, I sometimes can't talk when I'm nervous. Um, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from my professors, um, so there's that, <laughs> and obviously Dr. Baker, and I didn't really kind of know my stuff when it comes to this, so you'll see me doing a lot of citations of papers and stuff. Right, I mean, I should say, yeah, I've, uh, you know, I, 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 I didn't just I uh, on Discord for my citations. Pick, pick out some, uh, you know, random undergraduate. We have... I, I've spoken before on, on Discord, and I suppose I should say, actually, I have a Discord. I should advertise that, and I'll put up a link to that. That'll be in the description. If people want to uh, talk about th this topic or any other topic in philosophy, you should come to the Discord. Um, and, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say that I'll be there because I don't really comment on, on, that very, on there very much. But Diana will be there because you comment on there quite a lot, right? Yes, yes I do. Um, <laughs> ping me. Um, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, look, I know that, uh, you know, my uh, interest in doing this particular video is just because I have, I, I have wanted to um, do something on philosophy of gender generally, I suppose, for quite a while. Um, I, I think that uh, it's just, a, yeah, it's a topic that I just happen to be interested in, but I haven't really had the chance to do a great, you know, do a particularly deep dive into it. And that's why I haven't done any, done any kind of video on it before. Um, and uh, so I, I, I don't know if you want to say anything about your uh, motivation or uh, interest in this. Yeah, sure. but, so yeah. um, this kind of stuff is, it means a lot to me personally, because um, it actually is kind of a well, philosophy and I have a long history. I mean, I was first introduced to philosophy when I was like eight or nine years old. When I read a book, I read a book on it, and I was just like, I devoured it. This is like the most interesting thing I'd ever heard of. You know, I learned was like epistemology, metaphysics, etc. I was like, this is so cool. Um, but with philosophy of trans topics in particular, I mean, I didn't know that I was trans when I was eight or nine. I knew that when I was like twelve, um, but not when I first started philosophy. So I guess those things first began to intersect um, when I became familiar with the work of some people who. Um, some certain academics who had written papers arguing against the validity of trans identities, um, in particular Alex Byrne and Tomas Bogardis, whose work we're going to discuss. So trigger warning for transphobia, um, if that upsets you, because it upset me quite a, quite a lot. Um, actually, I remember one moment when, because of these arguments, because of the things written by Byrne and Bogardis, this is true. I was once actually on the on the floor of my bathroom sobbing, and I even vomited in the toilet because of how upsetting. And because of the fact that, like, I, not their arguments, but because of the fact that, like, I didn't feel as though I could, like, question or challenge them. I always felt like, you know, who am I, just some, like, random nobody to say that, that this is wrong? And they found their reasoning quite quite interesting. Um, and so what happened later wasn't really that I, wasn't that I, like, um, because that's when I began reading the literature. And it wasn't that I found some miraculous magic bullet because I began reading some papers then that now I see now I'm really like but back then it wasn't like the magic thing to cure my, the doubts that I now had um, 
about my own identity and whether it was like something that I could rationally have. But uh, it was what happened was I began to realize like, yes, I can think for myself. You know, I'm I'm entitled to have my own thoughts. I'm allowed to have my own opinions. You know, I I don't have to just listen to what somebody else says and then, you know, like find some like, oh, yes, this one paper is the magic bullet that does everything and just like latch onto that or, or whatnot. Like I can think for myself. I can make my own ideas and combine things other people have said and um, like, you know, change things, adapt things. And like it was me learning to think for myself like that, that really um, it turned something that was that used to be um, you know, that like sort of hounded my mind into like one of my great passions, because now this has become like one of my favorite areas of philosophy. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, th thanks. Thanks for that. So, um, I, I, I guess the, the the place to the best place to start then um, would be with the question would be something like, um, you know, well, what, like, what, what is gender, right? I mean, um, sure. Well, yeah. here's, the, here's the deal about gender. Here's why it's so um, complicated, because there actually isn't gender isn't actually one thing. It's actually two things in a trench coat. That's all I like to say. Right. Um, that was why I just so had, I've, so, I've I, I, like, I had such difficulty. Sorry. sorry to interrupt. I, I realized I was going to have to ask this You're question. The host here. I was like, what, how, wait a minute, how do I phrase this? Because uh, yeah. my phrase is just like, what is gender great. identity or what is, you know, and then I- uh, We're gonna get to that, we're gonna get to that. Okay, so <clears throat> I like a philosopher named Catherine Jenkins and um, she did a paper in 2016, well, let me get the title of it. I'm got, I actually have full papers open in a different tab while I'm doing this so I can do my citations properly. Um, let's see here, Jenkins, 2016, yes. Paper called Amelioration and Inclusion, Gender Identity and the Concept of Woman. Um, and what she argues in that paper is she does, I don't know if it's originally her or if it's, if she got the idea from somewhere else. Let me, uh, let me see. Uh, where did, oh, sorry. <laughs> We're doing research live here. <laughs> Making sure that I'm, my claims are correct. Um, yes, okay, she does, she does. So Catherine Jenkins does this original thing where she splits gender into two different concepts because she realizes that these things get conflated. So there's gender, what she calls gender class, and gender identity, and I endorse this distinction. I joke that like the sex gender distinction is for beginners. The real like, the real chads know about the gender as class, gender as identity distinction. So what are those two things? So what happens is we have to begin at the beginning with sex. So I think biological sex is real. Some people think that it's um, just a social construct. I think it's a, I think that sex is a biological reality. But um, the problem with sex, though, is that it's not a binary. It's actually more like a spectrum. That's sort of how we, we see it now with the more up-to-date biology. Um, like there's a good article about it in, na in Nature. I read there's a Nature paper about um, the spectrum of sex, pretty fascinating. And so what happens is, is that although um, sex, I think is sort of like a natural kind, um, we, there are like borderline and edge cases with intersex individuals. And so there are times when it's not really objective whether a per, whether an, uh, an infant is male or female. And so it's kind of a judgment call. And so to, um, and intersex people are quite common, like 2% of the population, I believe. So because of that, we use the phrases assigned male and or assigned male at birth and assigned female or assigned female at birth. And so that's why it makes sense to talk about, in some cases we talk about biological sex, in other cases we talk about assigned sex. These are two different concepts. But, um, one is about sex itself, the other is about like specific sex categories, um, but they're both legitimate concepts. Uh, I use both of those terms when appropriate. So we start with sex and then we get gender classes. And that's sort of like, it's sort of like a hierarchy. So imagine it's like the whole structure of, of sex and gender is like a three layered cake. So on our bottom layer, we've got sex. Then on the layer above that, we've got gender, what are called gender classes. So that is the traditional interpretation of gender, where gender is the social, um, the social interpretation of sex, as the feminist slogan goes. So this is where we get um, like specific social roles and norms and expectations um, based on sex traits, based on sex assignment. Um, so we can begin at the bottom layer with like an understanding of uh, there's like female as sex. And now on our second layer, we've got female as gender class. And then on our top layer, the, the third layer, we've got gender identity. And it's hierarchical because gender identity depends, it is grounded in classes. I mean, that, that's what Jenkins argues in this paper and in another paper um, called Torden in account of gender identity. I believe it's called 2018. 
an account. Yes, that's what it's called. Okay. Um, and so what happens is her model of what how gender identity works is that um, there are these uh, certain, like I said, roles, norms, expectations, et cetera, that we have for certain gender classes. And people can subjectively, regardless of their assigned sex, people can subjectively perceive these norms as relevant to them. And different gender identities are constructed based on different sort of phenomenal experiences. I see it as a kind of qualia. Um, phenomenal experiences of these gender norms being relevant to you. Um, that's why she calls it the norm relevance account, norm relevancy account. Um, so gender identity exists because gender classes exist. Gender classes exist because sex exists. So it's like those three layers is the, is the structure of it. That's what I get from reading Jenkins. Okay. Um, so, ge so gender identity, um, I, I mean, I just want to sort of clarify this. Uh, sure. On, on this view, um, gender identity, you said that it amount, it, so it consists in perceiving certain norms and roles and expectations and so on that are associated with gender classes as being relevant to you. That's correct. Um, see that sound. See, I I don't know. My my initial reaction to that is that sounds a, uh, just a bit. Um, I I kind of feel like like all of the norms and expectations and uh, and so on associated with any gender are relevant to me. So like, okay, I don't. Uh, I, I wouldn't class myself as uh, as a woman, and I'm aware that I'm not classed as a woman by other people, right? So exactly. Um, but. It, it seems that all of the sort of norms and expectations and so on that fall upon women are still relevant to me. It's like surely anybody that's you know, anybody that exists in a society, right? Um, the norms that uh, kind of bind other people are going to be relevant to them. Um, I mean, just because, you know, the way that we treat women is relevant to me, right? Let me give an example from Jenkins' paper so you get what she's trying to say, what, what I'm trying to say, um, interpreting and reading her. She's great. Um, but uh, she gives an example of shaving one's legs because in our society, in, in, dom in mo the modern Western world, there's an expectation and a norm that says women should shave their legs. And then that's her expectation that says women have shaved legs. But um, in the paper, she discusses that norm particularly, the women should shave their legs. And so what happens is, if you identify as a woman, then you will see that norm as relevant to you. So that means that if you don't shave your legs, you will perceive, you will feel as though you are in violation of a norm. So you, you will feel like you are violating an important an important norm. And by the, and uh, I should clarify that this does not mean that women have to endorse these norms. So you might feel like you're violating a norm, and that's cool. So that that's an example. You might. Um, it does not mean that you have to conform to them. It's just something that she stresses very importantly. Identifying as woman does not mean conforming to these expectations and norms. It, it can mean defying them. You know, it can mean openly saying like, "Yes, I am flouting a norm for women, and that's cool. That's great. I'm going to be myself." But the difference is that if you don't identify as a woman, it's like norm. You know what norm? Like men don't even think about that. It doesn't even enter their minds. If you identify as a man, it's not even going to enter in, in, into your thoughts. Now, if you are a trans man, then it might enter your thoughts because it's being imposed on you from others. And you feel like, Ugh, you know, they don't know. I'm, it's like if you're, if, if you're a closeted, you know, um, imagine if a closeted trans boy, uh, teenage trans boy, and he's like, oh, I have to shave my legs again. You know, he'll be like, this is, this is so stupid, you know, but it won't be like a, rebellion like with the person who identifies as a with with the person identifying as a woman mm. you know it'll be like i can't believe i have to conform to this you know this doesn't even this doesn't apply to me at all and obviously for cis men it just doesn't even enter their, doesn't even enter their thoughts so that's sort of what she means by relevance to, to give an example it's not like recognizing you know for political purposes that the fact if you're a male feminist it might be relevant to you in the sense that you care about women being able to just dress how they please but it's not the kind of relevance that she's talking about Okay, yeah, I, I get that. to you personally. I, I see. The, but now I, I worry that this, I, and you kind of have hinted at this yourself with the example of the trans man. Now, now I worry that this is just going to entail that, uh, that, that transgender people um, are not actually their stated gender. Because, they're, like you said, a trans man may well perceive the norms that are... Uh, so they may perceive the 
norms that are associated with the uh, gender woman as applying to as in some sense being relevant to them because you know there's this expectation um that that they conform to those norms actually that same that same worry was raised by talia may betcher in a reply to this paper um so you're not alone so betcher also said that um but she worried, Betcher worried that um, this seems to entail that a lot of people, that a lot of trans people who are either closeted or just begin their transitions aren't their actual stated gender. But um, I don't actually see that because I think of it as, as you're talking about relevance, it's clearly a, a specific kind of relevance. And in fact, I sort of, I'm working on some other parts of my like sort of overarching theory of gender and in the, um, I think of something called like the existential context. This isn't something different, but it sort of applies here, I guess. Um, and that's the idea that it's sort of like, I mean, Betcher herself talked about this in a paper. She did a paper called, um, I think it's called like, uh, what's it called? Betcher did a paper. It was in the book. She did it, for, it was for an anthology called, you know, you've, it was called You've Changed, um, Sexual Reassignment, Personal Identity. Let me find, yes, I think it's called first person, I think it's called trans identities and first person authority. Let me look it up and pull papers to confirm this. Yes, I got it right. I even got the right uh, anthology. Yes, it's called trans identities and first person authority. Time and Metro 2009. Um, and she discusses how trans identities are inherently what she calls existential. Um, they are about like, they are about who we are on a very sort of deep personal level. And so these things can, I sort of differentiate between things like, superficially being relevant in the sense that you have to comply to them and things being like really meaningful to you, like things actually mattering, like deeply mattering to you. And for example, I myself can tell the difference because um, I'm still like um, sort of like beginning-ish of my transition. And so because of that, like I can clearly sense a difference between there's a feeling of like when um, I present more feminine and I obey and I like try to obey the sort of like feminine norms. I feel like, yes, you know, this is, this is me. This is, this is meaningful to me. This is important, you know, but when I have to um, like present more masculine because I'm doing something like, let's say, um, I don't know if, if I were going to see my extended family, I would feel like, you know, uh, I have to do this. It, it, there's a very different sense of relevance. And that's why I, I think that she's onto something here. Yeah, okay, but couldn't it, I mean, won't it be the case that this is also true for uh, cisgender women? I mean, so cisgender women will uh, will also have that feeling of, that, like, so the different feeling of relevance that you've described, it seems like cisgender mm -hmm. women will also probably have that attitude to the norms that are, uh, you know, maybe expected of them, imposed on them. Um, like, it uh, so... I don't know if that, uh, like, is that a problem here? Um, I don't think so, because, I mean, uh, Catherine Jenkins, who wrote this account, is a cis woman, so she should know. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not cis, obviously, I wouldn't know, but she probably does. Um, and uh, I just, like, I mean, hmm. I'm not sure how to apply to that, honestly. I mean, luckily, um, this account is my personal favorite account of gender identity. It's the one that makes the most sense to me because it, it's the one that both makes the most theoretical sense. It's very theoretically pleasing in my view. It's very elegant. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also, I mean, compared to the other ones, yeah, it's, it's pretty elegant, but like it also, um, agrees with my experience. And if it agrees with Jenkins experience as well, that's, that's awesome because that means that what's important here, um, as Alex Byrne has talked about in an essay called What is the New Identity for Arc Digital? Um, we need to have it, we, it's very important that, I mean, he's doing it as a, he's doing it to be like antagonistic to trans people. He's like, here's what you must do. But I think he, agree, I think I agree with him when he says, we had to come up with the three of gender identity where trans people and cis people with the same identity can be said to have the same identity in the sense where it's like the same process is sort of happening here, the same mental, or they're in the same mental state, you know, with regard to something. And if Jenkins and I agree about this, what this mental state is, that that's, that's hugely important. Um, I just, I actually, uh, okay, so, so the, the assumption here is that we need an account of gender identity that has it that, say, cisgender women and transgender women are in the same, the same kind of mental state, the same process. Exactly. Going on, right. Okay. So I, I, so the worry that I or kind of have about, um, 
stuff that I read about gender identity is I always feel like, um, okay, uh, why shouldn't it just be the case? I mean, so it always feels to me like the, the notion of gender identity is kind of a, uh, you know, like a, a sort of theoretical postulate. And I have this worry that like, maybe there isn't really anything that say even specifically cisgender women uh, have in common with respect to their psychological states. Um, there that, is you know, an makes account them that can account for that necessary. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I... A different account that can apply to your worry. You might prefer a different account. So <laughs> um, I'm sorry, but, uh, I, just, I, I just want to oh, I just want to make it make it make it explicit. Just so I've got my... so I guess the worry that I have right um, is that um, there isn't going to be if you look at say just cisgender women. Um, there isn't actually going to be anything in particular that they have in common that counts as a gender identity. Similarly, if you look at transgender women, there won't be anything in particular that they have in common. So, you know, the, the, the very idea of then saying, well, we're looking for something which allows us to say that this whole group, like both cisgender women and transgender women have in common. I'm like, well, wait a minute, even, you know, really specific groups of people, like even if you were looking at, I don't know, uh, wealthy uh, uh, black women, let's say. I, I, I don't know if I would expect there to be anything that like they have in common that, um, it, you know, with respect to like these psychological and mental states. Um, but, it, it, you know, so that's, that's, that, that's, the, that's the worry I have with this um, sort of methodological assumption, I guess, that you've just stated from, from Byrne. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, so um, there is a model of gender identity that I find very interesting um, that I think could address your worries. It's one that I kind of have on the back burner. I'm known for changing my mind a lot because I often have like these backup views. It's, I'm known for doing this. I always have like a backup view of some view that doesn't work out. And I still, I still like this view. I still think this is my preferred view. But if necessary, I have a different one. So it's, instead of that view, I outlined at the very beginning. So this one comes from Iskra Faleva in a paper called The Gender Puzzles. Um, and Faleva here is fascinating because she's not trying to make a view of gender identity, but she does anyways. It's like accidental. She makes, makes, accidentally makes a brilliant theory of, of identity. Hers is distinct because hers is functionalist. So she has a functionalist approach to what gender identity is. Um, and I should note that in the paper itself, she doesn't, she doesn't view it this way. She sees it as defining what a woman is not what identity is, but she ends up defining identity anyways. It's like on accident. She doesn't realize she's doing it. Um, so what is the Falevist account? It's got two layers to it. Once again, I see lots of these two layers. You, you, you have to invoke some layers to explain a lot of these things. So to Faleva, there's both a substantial layer and a procedural layer. So a procedural layer is this procedural definition is that S identifies as a woman if and only if um, S would, under ideal epistemic conditions, believe that S is a woman. This is my paraphrase. I don't have the paper in front of me right now. Um, I can look it up and confirm the wording, but I'm too lazy to do that. I already look at enough papers tonight. So um, that's the functionalist layer. It's like whatever causes belief under ideal epistemic conditions. Um, and then, what was the substantial layer? You know, what, what causes these beliefs? And so, she lists four factors. The first one is um, comfort sorry, or I, discomfort. I, I, just wanna, um, I just wanna stop before we move on. Sure. So, my immediate uh, reaction to this is, wait, what, the, what are ideal epistemic conditions in this context? Um, sure, uh, I've already thought of that. So, ideal conditions would be, I have the two, so I have two conditions here for, for the ideal epistemic conditions. Number one is no false lemmas. And so I see that as being, um, actually no, more like no causal false lemmas because I can imagine, I can imagine, um, actually no, wait, wait, I'm, I'm <laughs> I, I messed that up. I think no false lemmas is, is enough um, because like, you can have a cis man um, who believes that he is a man solely because um, he believes that everyone with a penis is a man. He has and he has a penis. So I think that's I disagree with that belief. So I think that's a false lemma. But I guess in the ideal scenario, he wouldn't have that false lemma, and he still identifies a man. So I think yeah, we're just gonna say no false lemmas. Um, that's the first condition. The second condition I think is like no. Um, relevant ignorance. So that's where it's things like um, you, 
specific identities or specific things, you need to know that they exist, that they're possible. I'll give you an example. So my own identity. I actually recently discovered that my identity is more complicated than I thought it was. And I guess you could say rediscovered because I thought of this like on and off a lot of the time. Phew, I'm talking, I'm pretty fast right now. I'm kind of excited. So. It's okay. Um, I, I, name... I think you're completely understandable. It's it's fine. <laughs> it's excellent. Okay, good. I want to be understandable. I'm not going to pull any tricks or anything. I'm, I'm, I'm just nervous. I talk fast. And also, I'm passionate. <laughs> the things, the effects combined. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, I identify as what's called a demigirl. That's our demi woman. And you're like, what? That's like a sort of, it's, it's a new identity that's like, well, it's not a new identity. It's a new label. The idea is that I identify as a woman, but like only partially because I partially feel like I'm just like a person. Like I sometimes feel like I'm just like a mind with a body, you know, but there, there's a part of me that's like very insistent, like, yes, I am a woman. And part of me is like, eh, I'm, I'm kind of just a human. I'm kind of just me, you know, I'm kind of just, I don't really like part of me doesn't kind of disconnect it from the whole gender thing and kind of use it from the outside. That's, that's also why I find this argument sort of compelling because I feel like I'm looking at the outside a lot of the time that like, I feel like, um, not all of me is on board with my own identity. So, um, but discovering that label meant a lot to me. It was like, seriously, like, oh my God, this is a real thing. I, I'm not like, you know, um, I'm not like just having imposter syndrome or, um, having internalized transphobia. Like, no, this is a real identity that you can have. And it made me like real, really, um, like satisfied. Like, yes, I like this. This is a really good label. And so because most people don't know that that label exists, if that would change the person's mind. Like if S um, doesn't know about a label or about an identity that exists, and um, if S knew about that label, it would change their mind. They'd be like, yes, that, that is crazy me. I'd call that relevant ignorance. So my two criteria for, for, epistemic, for ideal epistemic conditions then are no false lemmas and no relevant ignorance. Okay, so can, can you state um, the, uh, this, this part of the theory again, the definition again? Um, Sure. Um, the procedural idea is the, so the procedural part is the S identifies as a woman or a gender G. Um, if, you know, if and only if, under ideal epistemic conditions, S would believe that S is uh, a woman or G. And I would further clarify in an existential context. That's sort of what I was getting at earlier. That's like, you know, because you can believe that, I guess it's like, it's, it's more like in, in a personal identity context with an emphasis on personal identity. You know, okay. if a person believes that they are, if a person um, believes that they are, are a woman, but solely in, in like a context of a feminist politics, but not like personally, then I think this would not, this might not count as identity. I don't know. I honestly don't know. But <laughs> what I mean is the case of like, consider a person who's like um, transmasculine um, and, you know, thinks of himself as like, uh, well, I'm classed as a woman, so I'm a, I'm a woman by social class, but that's not who I really am. Stuff like that is what I mean. Right. Um, that that's something I would not consider to be like the existential personal identity context. Okay, so I think that um, I mean a worry that I would have about this is what if there isn't any unique answer or uh, regarding like what a person would identify as under ideal epistemic conditions? Because I, I mean my, <clears throat> my my feeling on this, my intuition uh, is that uh, oh. how we conceive of ourselves is very closely tied up with just you know the the way that society is and uh uh the sort of um you know distinctions that are that are drawn um within societies the way that we divide up people and i would have thought that like in different sort of social contexts um a person or at least there could well be people who would just end up coming to have uh very different views about what their identity is um i won't say that this is the case for like everybody i mean you know maybe in some people um you know their uh uh fine, identification you know do is... actually oh sorry we can do something we can fix that problem already there's already an idea that i have similar to this so okay. peter railton has a thing for his um uh he has an analytic moral naturalism, I believe. Uh, I think it's it's like a reductionist. He has a reductionist moral naturalism. You did, a, you did a video on this. You should know about this. You remember that uh, video? So, yeah, but but I also um, I also don't like Railton's account at all. So you know, <laughs> it's just an idea. It's just a suggestion. So I actually thought of this idea while watching your video. By the way, I was thinking about this stuff and watching your video. I was like, oh, 
I, I, so that comes from you. So um, you talk about how on Railton has so there's like a person we'll call her Verity because you're a Hoovian, I guess. Right. Um, and there's Verity has certain desires and certain beliefs, and we're trying to ask ourselves like what's objectively what is objectively good for Verity, and Railton's answer is possibly a Verity plus. You know, and Verity plus it's like a super intelligence, and that creates you know lots of issues. Um, but what I'm actually asking for is something that I think is much narrower, which is just those no false lemmas, no relevant ignorance, no relevant ignorance. And so, um, for a cis man, for example, like the person I posed earlier was actually ignorant of like of one particular thing. Like, he has one false lemma. That is, he believes that he is a man, you know, because he has a penis. So we'll, you know, we'll call him like Dave. <laughs> I don't know. It's just random name. So Dave plus would be Dave with just that one belief changed. That's, that's basically the same person. That's almost the same person. And in fact, okay. I think that many people, um, if you're sufficiently quote unquote woke enough, I don't even know what that means. But if you if you know enough about this kind of stuff, I think that like like I'm gonna be I'm gonna venture a guess. I think that I am Diana Plus in that sense. Like I I believe that I have no false lemmas, and as far as I know, I don't think I have any relevant ignorance um, I, at this moment in time. So okay. because of that, um, you might very well be Kane Plus. You know, it's et cetera. So these, unlike Railton, where the plus people are like, you should watch the Railton video if you don't know what we're talking about. I'm sorry. But it's like, unlike in Railton's account, where the plus agents are like super intelligences um, who have like, who know about all the like Laplacian demon level analysis of like every particle uh, in, in wave in the universe and all the physical laws and, you know, know all about how to achieve desires. Like the plus agents in my account just need to have those two characteristics about gender specifically. Okay, so in the case of somebody, many cases, um, people are their plus agents. Right. So with with somebody, uh, I think you said Dave, right? I guess the way yeah. that I was thinking about it was, well, you know, if Dave had been brought up in a completely different society, which conceived of gender differently, um, then you know, if you sort of remove all of the relevant ignorance from from that Dave, then you know, he gets a he might have a different gender identity. It's um, true, but that's, that's but that's not true. going to be an issue, right? Because it's just like okay, yeah, that's just true. true. Right, yeah. That's the, that's the problem. You don't even need to do that at all because that's the issue. Then you don't even need to use the plus agents because I was talking about something different. I thought if you were talking about somebody who's been transplanted into a different culture, um, and I guess that might have that might be the problem by talking about at different times. But the thing is, the gender identity is isn't innate. It is learned. There's a biological component to it, but it does come from when we are as as young children. We do sort of absorb the concepts of our culture, and so you know it's sort of. The direction that we're going to be in is sort of like, I think that the science on this is sort of still emerging, but I think that around age three, already like a core identity is sort of like already kind of locked. Um, and it's interesting because of the fact that in most, uh, like in, in most children, they just know like, you know, I am a boy or I am a girl at this age. And even many trans kids do that, actually. There are many you know, trans people who from that, from that age flat out are like, you know, um, I am a boy or I'm a girl and it's not their assigned uh, sex. Now, what's interesting, though, is that trans people very frequently, including myself, by the way, report like sort of vaguely feeling that like they were more of their identified gender, even as a child, but they couldn't put their finger on it. Like, for example, um, I was a young quote unquote boy um, who, unlike, you know, like, unlike the other uh, boys, who like sort of avoid girls. My friends have basically, I've always basically been friends with girls. That's just the thing about me. I never had a period where I was like, oh, I'm, I mean, because of the way that I, the society, you know, raises children, I was made, I was sort of made to socialize with boys, but I always really felt more comfortable around girls. You know, and so there's the sort of thing where it's like, I can tell there was definitely something even at that early age that hadn't really sort of blossomed into how I think of myself now, but it wasn't like the insistent you know, I am this. It was sort of like a, it was like a, the vague beginning of a Humerian seeming, if you will. Okay. Michael Humor, of course. A little humor joke. Oh, okay. humor, humor. <laughs> I'm cringe. Um, right. Okay. Um, I have a, a second concern about about this. Um, uh, I'm yeah, not sure how, how much of a problem this is, but. You know, so my sort of line when it comes to, uh, I mean, pr pretty much everything, to be honest, is I, I don't think that we ever. So I, I think that um, 
uh, you know, uh, there aren't really any natural kinds. I think that in any sort of model that we have of the world, there's going to be a great deal of idealization and simplification. I think this is especially true um, uh, when it comes to, you know, models of human societies and the distinctions that we draw between human mm. beings. Um, and so there is a part of me that wants to say, well, like any sort of view that we have, uh, any claim that we make about, um, you know, uh, things like personal identity or different classes of human beings, there's going to be some sense in which that that's like false. Or maybe I, I should say it's approximately true. But of course, to say that something is approximately true is just to say that it is in some respect uh, false. Um, so, you know, when I think about like, well, what would it, you know, what would it be to like, I like in other words, let me put it this way. I'm not sure that we um, can ever access um, ideal epistemic conditions in the sense of having um, just a kind of like perfectly true uh, account, uh, uh, particularly when it comes to human societies. Um, so uh, is, is that an issue? I guess here, okay, I guess here we could do, okay, so I guess here we could do the modification I was thinking about doing earlier, because before I said no false lemmas, and so I guess we could, I guess that for you we could do a version where it's like, oh, we don't believe, we don't believe in causation though. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> but if you did, if you did, I would say, um, I might, man, am I talking too loudly? I just realized I'm kind of shouting. I, it's, it's, oh, no I problem. Just want to get passionate. it's, it's fine. <laughs> okay. I'm kind of shouting, <laughs> but you could do a thing where it's like no causally efficacious false lemmas. That's just kind of get at earlier. I'm trying to get at like, you know, because I, I believe in Lewisian theories of causation, you know, counterfactual theories of causation. So, um, you could say, if the like the or Dave's um, false lemma about you know the fact that why he is a man, um, that's not causally efficacious in my view because by, by stipulation I think he does in fact identify as a man. So if uh, if if he were uh, if he were uh, woken <laughs> from his uh, unwoke slumber, he would still identify as a man. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so I, I guess we should probably, you know, I, 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 end, I, I ended up going on this r rather long tangent. Well, actually, I guess it's not a tangent. It's entirely relevant to the topic. Uh, but about the the first half of Philever's Fili uh, theory. And uh, you is, were is about to... Is Am I pronouncing it wrong? Um, oh, I, I, don't, I don't know. To pronounce it again? How, how I have no idea. Pronounce? I've been saying Philever the whole time. Oh, Philever. Uh, <laughs> I, no, we'll yeah. I get I, I just pronounce it well, like, I, I pronounced... Um, there was somebody I was I mentioned some philosopher um, I think in my in my in one of my field classes and in, in my only field class sorry um, and uh, I think the professor was like oh you mispronounced that it's 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 this instead and I I forget the name but I remember it was like oh yeah because I mean I mostly just read so I don't know how things are pronounced a lot of the time maybe it was uh, maybe it was Reen Descartes. Uh... <laughs> no, it was not Descartes. I didn't put Descartes before the horse. Um, yeah, so I, I don't I don't know how to pronounce uh, Philivers, Philavers. I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, but um, yeah, so uh, we so there's this. Uh, did you say procedural account? And um, yes. And then you were going to explain the next part of it. Uh, Oh, oh yeah. yeah, sorry. By the way, while you were doing this, I just looked up um, because I'm still Jenkins build. That's still my current like you know. That's the other thing I think is correct. Um, so I looked at the paper actually. I have it now up here on my screen, and um, I'm trying to see if there's anything. So the way that she let me go into more detail about her account because it's more complicated than just the relevance thing. That's the core of it. So um, like so she begins here a quote. And now I am now reading verbatim from her from Jenkins quote. On my account, which I'll describe as the normal relevancy account, to say that someone has a female gender identity is to say that she experiences the norms that are associated with women in her, in her, social, con in her social context as relevant to her. The account begins with a picture of the way that agents interact with, with norms governing social space. This picture is explained by the way of metaphor borrowed from William E. Cross by Haslinger, that of an embodied map of social space that is calibrated relative to, to one or another set of social norms. The idea conveyed by this metaphor is that a person typically has an internalized sense of the norms operating in social spaces that they regularly navigate, and the implications of those norms for the status of their own behavior as norm compliant or norm violating, where this sense can be thought by analogy with, with annotations made in a personal copy of a standard issue map of, of a physical region. 
And then she says, to take a very basic example, suppose that a woman, man, and, and non-binary person were all work in the same building. And he's given a map of that building and asked to annotate it in ways that indicate how they experience different spaces. A woman's map might have the female toilets marked with a spa as a space which, where she is able to go, and the male toilets marked as a space where she is not able to go. The man's map may be the opposite way around, and assuming as is sadly common that the, the building lacks an initial toilets, the non-binary person's map might have all toilets marked as uncomfortable places which might fraught with stress and danger. For example, it concerns specially gendered places, but can be extended to, to apply to places that are not explicitly gendered. Uh, and then she says, suppose that the workplace is a hostile environment for women, specifically in meetings women are regularly talked over, ignored, or belittled. In this case, the meeting room might be marked as somewhere I'm not supposed to be speak much on a woman's map, but not on a man's map. So okay. actually, it's interesting thing thing here about bathrooms, which is that I personally, like, I don't really feel comfortable in either one of the, the typical bathrooms. Like, um, when I use, like, a men's room, this is, this is kind of personal, I don't know if this is like, but... When I think it's kind of awkward, I guess. When I go into a men's room, I often feel like I've kind of betrayed myself. Like I, I it, it's sort of like a subtle like, like I'm it's like I'm, I'm a sellout. Like when I do that, I feel like I've sort of sold out something important about who I am. But I guess it's marked as like a no-go area on my map. At the same time, um, when I use a, I've used the women's room like once, and I was terrified <laughs> because like um, I don't look super feminine yet. Uh, so I was like. Ah! No, I think I've used it like twice, in, but in I've used it once time twice, but like in a very similar period, like twice in like the same morning, um, just because I, I was kind of trying it out, um, and I felt like unbelievably anxious, like my heart was pounding, and I was like, oh my god, please tell me that no one's looking at me, please, please, I don't want anyone to look at me, um, like it was like super nervous, but I do actually feel comfortable with the neutral bathrooms. So they're actually feel like pretty comfortable, so I guess that could be a part that that could be like the sort of non-binary part of my identity. Um, or it could just be the fact that, like, that could be sort of imposition versus relevance thing, or it's like, I don't feel like women's bathrooms are a no-go because they violate who I am, or in some way, like, aren't relevant to me. But to me, it's more like, I'm, like, literally scared of, like, actually being, like, um, I'm scared of either making someone uncomfortable because I don't want to do that, I'm a nice person, and I'm also scared of, like, being, like, physically, like, confronted, like, what are you doing in here? So that's very different from the sort of map that she's talking about, I guess. Um, I guess I think it is. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I'm not. I didn't write this paper. I'm not her. So. Well, I guess. Um, uh, I mean, my my initial thought as you were saying that was, well, um, this kind of it, it relates to this thing I was saying earlier about how you know you're not. Go so maybe you're not going to find that there is anything in common um, when you look. Uh, any particular group of women and i would take it that if you imagine people drawing these maps well probably everybody's gonna come up with a slightly different kind uh -huh, of map but there's, Jenkins, there's a thing about that there's a thing i forgot to mention because well i, 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 I wasn't saying mentioned. this is a criticism actually i was saying this is oh well maybe this kind of fits in um with this uh uh, uh. so like i'd mentioned this point that you know, I take it that the distinct that whenever we draw distinctions, we're always engaged in some sort of idealization or simplification. But um, I take it if you were to ask people to draw these maps, you'd probably find some uh, broad similarities. You know, so there'd be certain sort of map styles, let's say, that would that would cluster. Um, and so, uh, she says that. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Actually, I, so the thing was that I had forgotten this because I focused on the relevance thing. Because to me, what I work on is. Um, Okay, let me explain to you why I wasn't thinking about that at the time and why I had to bring the paper up to be reminded of it. Like it's now that I, now that I can see it in front of me, I, I was reminded of it that she has a response to this. I don't need to go Faleva. Um, but the reason why I was thinking about relevance in particular is because of the fact that um, criticism of this account by uh, Robin Dembroff in the paper Beyond Binary, um, published in I think twenty. It's called. Called, uh, Beyond Binary, Gender Career is Critical Gender Kind by Robin Dembroff, Philosopher's Imprint 2020. Um, and in this paper, Dembroff critiques this account because they say that it can't describe non-binary people fairly. Um, so, for instance, like, um, uh, she defines, uh, she, and she, did you mean Jenkins, defines non-binary as follows, quote, a subject S is a non-binary gender identity if and only if S's internal map is neither formed so as to guide someone class as a woman to the social and material realities that are in that context characteristic of women as a class, nor formed to guide someone class as a man to the social and material realities that are in that context characteristic of man as, men as a class. Now, why is this a problem? Because of the fact that some non-binary people are women or men. 
In fact, some identify as being, as being both. But like more specifically, they're worried by the fact that some people identify as non-binary women. And actually, what's funny is that even though Dembroff claims that this account that this dooms the account, like the fact that there are non-binary women sort of dooms the account, I identify as non-binary women, you know, as of now, now that I discovered the demi the demi woman thing. And I love the Jenkins account. So I was trying to find ways to make them compatible. That's sort of like my my main focus of my research here. Um that's why I wasn't thinking about this issue, because it didn't really come up for me. It was like a it's it's not really the one that was on my radar. I was thinking about the Demprof criticism, um, but yeah, she has a response to it. She says here, um, scrolling back up, she says, "quote The vendor of the normal relevancy account need not be committed to the claim that gender norms are uniform across social space. Social expectations placed on women, for example, vary between different communities and are heavily influenced by, by interlocking norms about race, class, sexuality, and so on. Thus, it will be vanishingly unlikely that a person would take all the norms associated with women to be relevant to her." Moreover, the type of comprehensive relevancy or relationship is not required. As I intend the non-relevancy account, for a person to have, say, a female gender identity, she simply needs to take some significant subset of the norms associated with women to be relevant to her, and not take a greater subset of the norms associated with another gender to be relevant to her. Um, now, why I... Um, that last part, though, actually is something that was appropriate, that was relevant to me. <laughs> so that was like something that was important to me. <laughs> and it was because of the fact that I actually, my account is a blend of Jenkins and Flava. So that's why I sort of went to Flava immediately. Because I actually have Flava's procedural account with Jenkins' sub -sub substantive account. So I actually use that, I use that um, functionalist procedural definition but to me, I interpret that as defining the cutoff points for at what point norms are sufficiently relevant. So that's sort of, I use, that's how I combine the accounts. Flavo has a whole different theory about what's substantive, and it's things like, you know, comfort is covered with one's body as it, you know, as it has sex characteristics. Um, um, relating, to, relating to a gender, like identifying with that gender, like feeling as though, like, um, I guess having a, a good relationship with, with, with other people of it identifying with them like politically maybe i don't know and then there's one about she even includes um like once it's like fashion taste i believe is like i think that's like criterion three and by the way none of these are, are necessary she clarifies that so, well even like i think even things like you know liking lipstick would be would, might count as being part of, of a feminine gender identity for her and to me that seems obviously wrong like my intuition as a trans person is that it's the other way around. It's like the, well, no, um, I like, it's, it's, it's socially constructed that women like lipstick. It could have been the other way around. It could have just as easily been that men like it. And so it's like, the reason why I like wearing lipstick is because it expresses how I feel about myself. That's, you know, that's sort of um, the way it goes. It's For Faleva, it's, it's opposite. For Faleva, it's that, oh, you identify as a woman because you like wearing lipstick. And I'm like, that's crazy. Right, yeah. I, I, I so... It's still going to be the case, though, that we're sort of tying. So we're still tying gender identity to these uh, norms. Norms. Um, yes, but so, it goes in a certain direction. Right. It's, so is this a, a is there a worry here, though, that, um, you know, when I think about, like, what would the kind of ideal society look like? Um, I would uh -huh. think it would be... <laughs> You I've had this exact worry. But I was going to say, well, you know, if I think about what the ideal society would look like, I would say, you know, it would be a world in which um, these sorts of norms that we associate with gender are just no longer in force. Um, I have had this exact right. concern. Okay. So, <laughs> believe it or not, this concern is actually so strong for me at points that I've been in the account over it because of this very concern. But I have a response to it now. So... My response to it is this. So I modify her account somewhat. I modify her account slightly. Um, because to Jenkins, what matters are norms. And she clearly sees norms as things like, well, I guess maybe she doesn't. Because she says here are things like, you know, spaces. But the example of a norm that she gives is women should shave their legs. And I agree with you that in, in a perfect world, that shouldn't exist as a norm. That's just because it's misogynistic. You know, it, it, it tries to say that women should look pretty for men. That, that's problem. That that's bad. That's that's sexist. So um, because of that, I think that that kind of norm wouldn't exist. But I think there would be there's like prescriptive norms, like the women should or men should, and I think that those sorts of things. Now, possibly some might still exist. Here's an example of one: women should support other women. 
that's another that might that might, that might still exist. In fact, that's another that many feminists believe in. So maybe there would still be femi- there might still be um, gendered norms, but uh, like perhaps to maintain to maintain the quality. Do you think that a norm in an ideal society uh, would be that women should support other women to a greater extent than they support men? Uh, or anything along those lines? Um, probably not. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't know because we're talking about utopia here, mind you. But um, I don't know. You know what? That's why the real problem, the, the real solution that I had to this problem, isn't that. But it's what I was getting at, which is, I think there are two kinds of norms. There's prescriptive norms, and then there's what I might call like expectations or possibly descriptive norms. And these are things like instead of um, because it's I think she mentions it at some point like um, uh, it's it's not um, oh damn it her thing does say it feels such nice but how people ought to be okay the mind is different because I think that it can still be supported by um, a lighter norm one that I call expectations those are these are things that are not like norms about how things should go but what about more about what you expect and I actually have an example of why I think this is this is necessary. Because otherwise, this account cannot explain um, bodily dysphoria. Here's why. Because like in dominant society, we don't have a norm that says women should have vaginas. It's not a norm that, we, that exists. We don't think of things as like, oh, they, they should you know have this part. We have a different norm, and it's women have vaginas. Um, it's I, not I, a, how they I, should I, behave I or how they should be. It's what they are. It's like an definition of like, that's what you're supposed to that is what you are expected to be. And so I think that these kinds of norms that are not prescriptive um, would still be, some of them could still be justifiable. And so because of that, we can have some of these like expectation or, or descriptive norms um, might, might still exist, I guess. Um, like for example, the thing about genitals, obviously, the way it exists now is, is transphobic because it's like the it's interpreted as generalization that's universal. It's like all women, you know, have vaginas. And so I guess in an ideal society, it might be something like women mostly, like women generally, or for the most part, have vaginas with exceptions. And so, the, but there would still be a bit of an expectation there, like just enough to allow for norm relevance. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I when you when you, when he said that thing about the the not being this prescriptive norm that women have vaginas, um, I guess I yeah. I, I I'd, I'd agree with that. But then we do, um, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about like, uh, you know, well, w- one of my good friends, uh, my friend Cole, um, is uh, publicly, uh, very publicly, she uh, ste- was sterilized um, because she didn't want to have kids. She had a tubal ligation. And she got like a lot of pushback on that. Like, there's definitely. I mean, I'm not sure if there would be like a norm that like you know women ought to have vaginas. Uh, but um, there certainly are like you know they they ought to have functioning vaginas. Maybe <laughs> they ought to have vaginas that function in the normal way or something along those lines. Um, might well be. There's uh, a difference. There's a yeah. very important difference, which is that. If you have a woman who doesn't shave her legs, she has like, you know, if she, if a woman has unshaved legs, the reaction to that is not, you know, the reaction to that is like, you should shave your legs. But when a, when a trans woman doesn't have a vagina, the reaction is you're not a, you're not a real woman, you know, which right. is false. I want to clarify that. I, I don't think that that's true, but these are very different reactions. And so it seems to me that one is, a, they're both enforced quite strongly, though. They're both enforced quite strongly. But one is like a prescriptive enforcement. The other one is a descriptive enforcement. Okay, so um, so just to clarify, then all that really all that you take to be required for um, this sort of Jenkins style account to work is yes. that there are certain um, expectations associated with each gender. Um, That's correct. Yeah, I think I'd probably uh, it's it's hard to see um, how solution. you would eliminate that in general, and it's also hard to see that it would be like a good um, thing to do. In the words of uh, Invincible, <laughs> that's the neat part. You don't. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So I get. I, 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 think, I don't want to learn those things. Well, yeah. I. I mean. I. I think. I. I when I. I want them to I, be better. I want yeah. them to be. I want them to be more fair. You know. Like yeah. for instance, I want to change the expectation about women's genitals to be from women have vaginas is like an absolute one hundred percent rule to the point where you're not valid if you don't have one to being like a women for the most part have vaginas although some do not. Right. See, I, I think sort of uh, lower expectations. 
there's something uh, kind of appealing um, uh, about the idea of just, I, I don't know, like completely abolishing. Well, I don't know, maybe it's not appealing not to, to me, me, but to, to me, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's I like, because I think I, it's because you're I think it's because you're envy. <laughs> I, I understand the appeal, right, of of like when, when people talk about like gender abolition and things like that. But I always just think, well, you know, a big in no practice, on that. in practice, it seems to me that um, look, there is there's always going to be a very socially significant distinction between at least two different types of people. Um, because there are just because of like the biological differences with respect to reproduction, right? So, so mm -hmm. there's there's always going to be this distinction. Um, so there's like a, a I guess a biological sex distinction, which is socially salient, and it's yes. really like how how are you going to get rid of that? How even in an ideal it's society, actually the exact argument made by Sally Haslinger. Um, Sally Haslinger has a paper called Future Genders, Future Races, two thousand and four, um, and in that paper she says exactly what you just said, almost word for word which is she compares race and gender. And she believes that race must be abolished. And I agree with her on that. Um, race has no reason to exist. It's, it's, um, it's a very bad construct. It's one that we should get rid of as soon as possible. Um, and by the way, by that, I don't mean to say I'm like, oh, I don't see color, but I mean like actively working, like actively working against making the concept of race no longer necessary because right now we do still kind of need it to correct for injustices we do need to sort of know that some people are that some people are black and to say black lives matter but like ideally when we have justice we shouldn't need to we should just be talking about people you know so that's the thing we should work to abolish but for gender she asked the same question she's the same question as you do and she says like well obviously there's always going to be these biological categories and they're always going to be socially relevant because like it's so important to us as a society. It's how we reproduce. It's like so important, you know, to keeping a society functional. It's always going to be socially relevant. And so, um, and by the way, because of that, I think there are always expectations. Like, for example, um, I hypothesize, you know, that even in, even if there were no like prescriptive norms specifically for women, I think that women would probably still prefer generally to dress in certain ways i mean it's just a guess i don't know um this may or may not be the case i have no idea because i don't i don't live in a feminist utopia but if they did then it would make sense um for people to experience this as a relevant expectation to them like oh the reason why i say this is because of the fact that like i feel like a lot of the a lot of the uh it's called gender euphoria that I experience, you know, when I sort of like present more feminine. It's not, Lincoln sees it as being like, yay, I'm obeying the rules. I don't really feel like, I don't really feel that way about it a lot. I don't feel that way about it like, um, at least not consciously. To me, it's more like the, I'm, I'm like, I'm acting like the other girls. That's why it feels like so meaningful to me. It's like, I'm, I'm acting like one of my identified gender. And so because of that, even if there were no rule, if they happened to do it anyway, I feel like it wouldn't diminish from, it wouldn't diminish my euphoria one bit. Right. I mean, so that's it, sort of like diff different theorizing from my have... experience to it to how it implies for, to the Jenkinsian account. Yeah. That's just, like different communities have, uh, you know, sort of different um, um, conventions. Right. I mean, uh, I, I, I might be a fan of the Grateful Dead and then I notice that they're all uh, wearing very similar clothes when they go to Grateful Dead concerts and maybe I just feel like I want to take part in that. I mean, I don't know if maybe that's a uh, uh, a bit of a shallow way of, <laughs> a shallow analogy with respect to the gender thing, but it, it kind of sounds like a similar sort of thing. It's about a sense of um, belonging or... Yeah, uh, exactly. Like, that's yeah. a big part of it for me. So that's a big part of it for me. That That's why I think that there really are, I think that... You know what? When I put on it, I think there really is an, an element of the I'm, you know, acting as, you know, society says the women are supposed to. I think that there is an element of that, I guess, when I really reflect on it, because there is um, like there is a sense of like, um, I don't know how to put this in. It's like it really isn't like the, oh, I am like, you know, I'm doing I'm like obeying what society says that I should do or like the like the importantly it's like this when I um trot when I like wear women's clothing it does not feel like a rebellion it doesn't feel like I'm like I'm you know I doesn't feel like I'm like I'm uh 
transgressing gender norms at all. It actually feels the exact opposite. It feels like finally I can conform to my to the gender norms that really matter to me. Um, and so uh, there, I think that Jenkins is right about that, but especially with the map thing, the map thing is really uh, a good analogy because of, like I said, how, um, I don't, because of what I was thinking about the way I was as a kid with having female friends, but like, um, I don't know about it being necessary to have that component. I feel like expectations would do just fine. Okay. So I would have it as like, that's why I think of it as like the, all the stuff, it's like the norms and the expectations, you know, and the sort of roles, et cetera, all that stuff that comes, everything that comes with the social categories, I think factors into gender identity, not just the specific things that Jenkins thinks does, they're just, just the prescriptive stuff. Um, okay, cool. So I don't know if, um, I, if if you wanted to like so so what's the sort of general summary of this? I, I suppose uh, you know like the the question that started this whole conversation that I I'd asked I think I, I I asked what is gender right and um, I don't know yeah. if you just want to uh, maybe give a a quick summary um, or maybe I should ask it in the way that you know when I did um, uh, an ask me anything recently I had like about <laughs> five people who kind but of is asked a woman? this question, but they asked it as, what is a woman? That seems to be the- Yes, okay, we can talk about this one, woo! <laughs> All right, this is this is the one I was waiting for. Okay, so I mentioned at the beginning of the video that like the impetus for why I'm into this topic, why am I interested in philosophy of gender? Um, that's my own, social, my own history with philosophy and stuff like that. But why this video has to do the particular thing that happened at my college? Because you see, a few weeks ago, Matt Walsh came, and Matt Walsh is infamous for being the what is a woman guy. Um, and I was like, so, um, so what happened was, it's not the question that's necessarily upsetting. It, it's like, okay, here's the way it works. So this guy, he goes up there and says things like, in the movie he says about trans people, he said, let me get the actual quote here, so you know that I'm not just making this up. Let me get the actual quote from the movie. He said this about trans people. He says, um... You see, this is all, this is insane. He says, quote, you are all child abusers. You prey upon impressionable children and indoctrinate them into your insane ideological cult, a cult which holds many fanatical views, but none so deranged as the idea that boys are girls and girls are boys. So this guy comes up here saying stuff like that. And then he asks, what is a woman? Which is a question that takes a, a, bit, of a, a bit of time to answer. Um, and is then like, like the things on uh, why I invited him, they're like gloating and they're like, oh, no one's coming to answer his question. Oh, they're so scared. They're so scared of Walsh. They're, 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 they're a bunch of cultists. And that's what made me feel like I was really, I didn't even go to campus that day because I was like fuming. I was so upset. And I was like, I wrote a very um, long rant where I really got like, I went like, uh, I started kind of flexing my intellect because I wanted to show like, I wanted to feel, <laughs> Uh, sometimes it happens when I feel sort of insecure. Um, basically, I was like, this mf'er thinks that <laughs> uh, thinks that nobody can answer his question just because he's acting rude and nobody's going to even... People who want to be able to answer it aren't going to be able to do that because it's going to take time and patience and he clearly isn't interested in any of that. So, um, part of why I wanted to do this very video is I wanted to show that, that trans people are not a bunch of fanatical cultists. Like we actually are capable of, of, criti of critical thinking and thinking about our beliefs. Like I know um, there's philosophy tube, which is Abigail Thorne, there's ContraPoints, you know, and I also want to be, um, I also kind of want to make my mark as a trans philosopher here. So I guess I knew it was a matter of time before this question came up and I'm excited because it's, because it's one of my favorite questions actually. I actually love this question. So let me give you the answer. All right, so there's two kinds of definition. There is what I could call a dictionary definition or a lexical or a lexical definition. And there's a conceptual analysis. And those are gonna be different. Because dictionary definition is easy, an adult female human. There you go. If you want the straight answer, you're done. That's what a woman is, an adult female human. That's an entirely acceptable answer. But the problem, and you know, many many trans shows are in the comments now like, yes, but like, you no, know, don't wait, hold up. Because yeah, the question I'm actually is, a bit surprised. Uh, you know, I was surprised about that because I'm like, wait a minute, uh, adult female human. That's isn't that like kind of a transphobic slogan? Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Okay. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. All right. So here's the thing. 
Every single dictionary, and yes, I checked. I looked through dozens of them, okay? Every single dictionary defines a woman as an adult female human. Don't believe me? Go to any dictionary you can find and look, at the, and look it up. I'll wait. Now, why does this matter? Because the transphobic slogan is different. It says women are adult human females. And that is a change in the word order, and that's deliberate. Because when we use the word female as a noun, we're talking about, we're typically talking about animals, not people. We typically don't call people females right. or males for that matter. We typically call animals females or males of a particular species. And so, because most animals don't have gender, female as a noun has a sex connotation. And so when they word it that way, it seems like they're defining it as a sex term exclusively. But the problem with that is it doesn't match usage. You know, I'm a big fan of what Wittgenstein said here. Meaning is use. And the fact of the matter is the trans people have for millennia um, used, and I really mean for millennia, I'll, I'll get to that, have used the word woman to not be a sex term, have called ourselves women and not meaning it in a, in a sex way. The example that I give is the Roman Empress Elagabalus, who was recorded by Cassius Dio, a Roman historian, as saying, call me not Lord, for I am a lady, and asking to be called, am asking to be called a uh, queen. You know, and et cetera, similar terms. And, you know, for all we know, I think that she meant that literally. I know that because my trans friends mean that, mean the same, mean similar things literally, and so I extrapolate. So this isn't new. This isn't some, like, new thing. Meaning is use, and the fact of the matter is that it's not always used as a sex term. It would be an inaccurate definition. Um, so that's why it's adult female human, because female, I mean, both of them are equally true. They're, they're both equally true definitions. One of them is like misleading connotations. So that's why the correct order is female human. That, that's the more, that's the less misleading order. Um, because female can mean lots of different things. Um, it can, it is predominantly um, a sex term, but importantly, it can be a gender class term. We can talk about, um, for instance, uh, we can talk about female clothing. That's not anything that has to do with sex, is it? That has to do with a, with a gender class associated with the sex, but it's still, that's not really a sex term. Um, we can talk about female pronouns being she, her. You know, well, we don't really, when we examine, you know, when we look at like an X chromosome, we don't see, you know, we don't see a little letter she, her on the chromosome. So when we say female pronouns, we're talking about a gendered concept, not a sex one. Um, and we can even use female to be an identity term. I know because people I know use it this way. Um, we actually, there's a very common phrase. People, as an adjective, we will talk about um, uh, trans women and girls as being trans female. That's something that I hear quite often, and it's quite natural to use that descriptor. We talk about people being trans female or cis female, and there it's obvious understood that female is a gender identity term. And so I think the ambiguity of female actually comes into the meaning of woman itself, because I'm what's called a subject contextualist about the meaning of this word. Um, I follow a brilliant, brilliant woman named Asa Diaz Leon. Um, I say <laughs> she got this idea mostly from from uh, I want to say her mentor, as far as I know, Jennifer Saul, um, Jennifer Mather Saul, who first proposed contextualism about, about gender terms. But she explained how they work perfectly because basically it's like this. Robin Demeroff has a similar idea. Demeroff says that gender terms are normative. Um, and their argument for this is they just they kind of hand wave and say, you know, David Hume, uh, you can't get an off from an is. But um, uh, Tomas Bogardis, uh, show what this doesn't work. <laughs> the, they actually know not quite because he did a paper um, critiquing the sex gender distinction. And the difference, though, is that he interprets the distinction as to be the female woman distinction. That's what it means, and I agree with him. That's, the, the, that's no distinction. That doesn't really exist. I think there's no distinction between, between female and woman. But um, because what I just said, because I'm a trans female, it's, it's not hard. It's not like it's easy to it's, that's not, you know, I'm not saying it in a sex term way. So I don't see oh, it being sorry, a sex term. I, 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 mean, I just want to clarify this. So, oh, yeah, um, sure. No, go yeah, ahead. So, so, so uh, you were saying that, that, um, uh, that, that in Bogardus's paper, Bogardus says that um, there isn't really a distinction between female and woman, right? That's correct. Um, but I mean, female, that's, female, human, and woman. Or yeah, female, female is how right. it's that. Um, so, but, but do we still want to have a sex gender? Dis I mean, presumably. Um, oh, yes, I, 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 I just said, stipulate I just said that I'm using the term female uh, to refer to sex, right? And then you would get a, the, the distinction between those things? Yeah, absolutely. You still would. Because, um, okay, here's the thing with, so 
I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here when I talked about um, how semantic specialism works. Basically, it's like this. Um, Demroff's argument for this position is, you know what, uh, we'll get to this later. I'll talk about what it is first. I'm, I'm, I'm ADHD. I, I'm like this. So, and also passionate. I've said it a billion times because it's true. I love philosophy. So, um, what is the contextualism? Basically, the idea is this, that the word woman does not, and girl is, is juvenile counterpart, does not have a single fixed meaning. It varies across contexts. And what determines the meaning of it in a context is um, the subject under discussion. So it has to do with the actual proposition that it's in, which is why I sometimes quote, to explain it, I sometimes quote Gottlob Frege, who said in his work, um, The Foundations of Arithmetic, he said, let me get the actual quote from Frege. Um, he said something called the context principle, which I think applies to this word. He said, quote, never ask for the meaning of a word in isolation, but only in the context of a proposition. So I think that that's something like that holds for the word woman and girl in particular, um, both proposition and the social context surrounding it. So what happens is, is that it's our normative considerations. This includes things like um, our political considerations, it includes political considerations, but I think over and above all of that, it includes moral considerations. That's like the king here of what determines, That's the, I guess you could say that's the queen of what determines the meaning of this word. Um, and other things sort of like are, are less are not as important. So I think it's predominantly our, our moral considerations um, to ter determine like what a woman is in a context. And so, so so explain why this works. You know, imagine there's a commitment between me, um, between me and Dave, between me and Matt Walsh, or between whoever you want. I would tell Dave because Walsh would just call me a pedophile and try to shoot me. <laughs> I don't know, but I imagine he wouldn't be too friendly. Imagine Dave is friendly. So. Um, I am talking to Dave, I'm doing like imaginary dialogue here with myself. And Dave says, you know, Dave, um, I guess you could say like, I'm dressed more femininely like I am sometimes, but I still kind of, um, but not super femininely, I still have my masculine voice. So Dave asks like, Dave says like, um, he looks at me and he says like, what gender are you? And I say, I'm a woman with, with this voice. And he's like puzzled and is like, well, no, you're not. I don't, I don't think you are. I think, I think you're a man wearing women's clothes. And I say, well, no, I'm a woman, you know? And it's like, it's like what do you mean by that? I say, you know, I'm an adult female, I'm an adult female human. He's like, well, that's bizarre. You're obviously, you know, that's not a sex, that's you're obviously not, you know, a female sex. I can tell by your voice. And I say, like, that's not what I meant. I meant that I have female gender identity. And here's the thing is that we can both agree on certain facts. If he knew all the facts, I can explain to him, we can agree on the fact that, you know, we can agree that my sex is, for the most part, male. We can agree, um, or that is, I'm assigned male at birth, it's more precise. I'm assigned male at birth. Um, we can agree about my presentation, and we can even agree about my identity. He could even, he could even agree and say, you know what, why doubt you? I'm going to presume that you have the experiences that you have. But he could, and even what a woman is, we could both agree adult female human is what it means. And we can both agree that the word female sometimes means an identity in certain contexts. But guess what? He could still say, nope, not a woman. Knowing all the facts, knowing every single descriptive fact, knowing every positive fact that is, he could know every single positive fact and still say, nope, you're not a woman. And why is that? Well, because that doesn't really matter. It's not important. And I think that reveals why it's syndicate contextualism is correct. Because it's fundamentally a normative decision. It's about what matters, what's relevant, what's important. And the reason why, to fully, to fully convince him, I need to give a normative claim. I need to explain why it's important. That is not a positive fact. That is a, that is a normative fact. Okay. Um, I had, uh, I don't, I, I uh, read the, uh, the Diaz-Leon paper, actually. Um, you read it? So, yeah, yeah. And, um, oh, nice! <laughs> I, uh, I, so, I, I've actually got it up. So, I, I just want to quote. Oh, uh, yes, good, she, good. Yeah, she starts with this, um, she, she gives a contextualist too. proposal from Jennifer Sol. Exactly. Right, um, which I'll just quote. So it's, X is a woman is true in a context C, if and only if X is human and relevantly similar, according to the standards that work in C, to most of those possessing all of the biological markers of female sex. Right. So totally agree. Yeah, so that's 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 Saul's proposal. And now, that's exactly um, right. yep. in, in the, so I suppose there's, you know, there's there's a response to what you said with respect to the conversation with Dave, where we might say, mm -hmm. well, you know, look, um, maybe what's just happening here is 
um, okay, so you guys are both using the term woman in slightly different ways. Um, so, ah, uh, yes. You know, like, and actually, this now this, this seems to be very much, uh, you know, in line with this contextualist proposal because, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe this, uh, like, counts. So maybe one way to put it is the uh, transphobic communities, for instance, just have a different sort of context. So there are different... Uh, standards that are relevant. Um, oh, so yes. I think um, I think Diaz Leon says that this is this is something of a worry about this kind of contextualist account. I mean, she tries to fix it, but she says, well, the worry is is that um, you know. I think the fix works. Yeah. So we're going to be able to say that the worry is just to clarify that we so trans transgender people will be able to make uh true so like when a transgender woman says i am a woman that's going to come out true on this contextualist proposal but then the worry is that it's also going to render true um the claims that the transphobic people make because in the context of transphobic communities uh, maybe you know having a vagina <laughs> or something is like the the relevant similarity criterion uh for you know what counts as as a woman um and but they're wrong, but they're normatively wrong. Well, yeah. So, I mean, the thing is, that I, I remember my initial reaction to this was, you know, I, I like I, I wondered whether, you know, like, do, do we does it matter whether it so like it, the claim? Um, let's take the claim. Verity is not a woman. And let's say that Verity is a transgender woman. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well. Does it really matter that uh, in, say, transphobic communities, that claim comes out as being true? Because I'm inclined to think that truth is kind of cheap, that you can have truth very easily. And, you know, I was thinking about... Um, uh, okay, you're a different with, account then. Well, I, I, I'll just, uh, just, yeah. Let me, uh, I know a different account that agrees with you on this one. So let me, um, can well, I... Can I, can I just of... kind of give an example? Just Sorry. To sort of know where <laughs> So um, I, I, was, I, I was thinking about um, the use of like slur terms. So, um, uh, you know, if, if somebody is, is gay, right, let's say that Dave is gay and I say Dave is a F, you know, uh, I won't say it, but, you know, the, the F word. Well, that's right? a, okay, now we're talking about different stuff here. So well, that's I, the, there's the, a classic the, example of it with the word kraut. This is back in the 40s. Um, there's a classic example of calling a German a kraut. Mm -hmm. And so it's like you're simultaneously saying when you say S is a kraut, we're saying S is German, and we're saying something derogatory about S at the same time. So we can, in my opinion, um, if you were to say, you know, uh, Dave is a, a gay slur, I think that would be true, but not something you could say unassertable. And that's, I think, what you're getting at here. Is right. Yeah. Is that well, what that's the thought. Is you know, if if so, somebody says, you know, Dave is an F. And then you ask, well, is that true or false? I feel like that's the wrong question. I mean, like, okay, uh, let's say that Dave is just very visibly gay. And so in that, in that sense, I'd say, well, look, there are certain, you know, application conditions or, or something that this, that this word had, you know, this word um, is supposed to, it's like drawing a distinction between different people. It's picking out a certain class of people. And indeed, Dave is among, uh, among those people. <clears throat> Um, so, like, there's at least some of the propositional content that is going to come out true, uh, but it's just irrelevant. I mean, it's like, okay, maybe it's true, but like, you, you know, you're still a prick if you say that. <laughs> like, All right. Um, so, um, so uh, before I get to my response to what you're concerned about Diaz Leon's account, let me first say that what you're saying actually agrees with an account by Elizabeth Barnes. Elizabeth Barnes has, has the exact same view as you about this. Um, she wrote a paper called, I think it's called Gender and Gender Terms, published in the journal News in 2020. Um, uh, and so, or, or now, I don't know how you pronounce that word, N-O-U-S. But um, in it, she makes the exact same point that you're making. So she has a view that I call, I've given it this name, I call it Barnesian prescriptivism, no, not prescript, permissivism, Barnesian permissivism. Because her view is permissivist. What, what she's saying is, she gives you 100% that... Saying these things can be true, but you're a dick if you say it. And so, importantly, she is like she is a sort of contextualist, I guess. Um, but she is more. Um, I think that um, 
I know her view centers on the fact that these things can be true but unassertable. So the difference, though, is this. It's not just about being a dick. It's not just about, like, being um, – it's because if you say that, you're also being misleading in important ways. So according to Elizabeth Barnes, if you were to say, you know, uh, if someone were to say of me, Diana is not a real woman, by saying that, that might be, according to Barnes, literally true because it might, you know, in that context, might, might you know, succeed in truth conditions. But it would be saying something very, you know, it would be saying something misleading and false, which is that there isn't a thing as a real woman in the first place. When for Barnes, it's all about, you know, it's just a word that doesn't really have anything robust. She, you know, she says that, quote, you know, there is no robust language independent facts, but mind independent facts about who is a woman or not. So, or language independent facts, I think it's just not mind independent, language independent. So, to her, saying things like that, um, that conveys uh, false information about how gender works. And so because of that, it's like, even technically true, it's still misleading. Or even saying something like Diana is a man, that would do the same thing. It would be conveying essentialism, which she says is, is false. So that's how Barnes responds to this kind of stuff. Okay, um, yeah, I, I see. So I think Barnes, if, if, Barnes's um, view is very close to mine. Right. So, so, so to, I, I suppose by analogy, it's a bit like if, uh, you know, if I was to say, um, I, I don't know, uh, uh, Frank ate all, of, so Frank ate some of the cake, right? If I say Frank ate some of the cake, um, that might be true. But if it's the case that Frank ate all of the cake, then it's kind of misleading. Um, exactly. Yeah. That's how she sees it. Right. So because of that, um, that's the Barnesian view. It's called permissivist because she thinks you can just go nuts. You can say, you can use these terms however you like. Um, you, the terms man and woman is how, as long as, however you like, um, as long as you're not saying misleading things about, this, about how gender works. And so um, to her, that precludes misgendering, you know, because of the fact, for the most part, because of the fact that like, to do that would be to say thing would be to you can't help propagating essentialism you know that is the view that, that the view that sex is gender and that there's no distinction at all you know um you can't help propagate these things that are false about um how the structure of gender actually works you know um and that includes most things that we would consider to be misgendering that is um barnes's view i find it to be actually a pretty interesting one so and that's your view then great i like i like that paper it's a good one Okay, well, so that that's uh, I guess one one option then. But um, there there is uh, Diaz Leon's uh, answer to yes, I'm Diaz Leon. Yeah. yeah. So I've made the most of her. <laughs> so, okay. So, so the problem then is that it looks like the contextualist proposal is go it will allow it, it, it is going to come out as true um, that you know Verity is a woman, but then the worry is okay in trans in transphobic communities. It won't uh, it's though. Just come out as false. So uh, do you want to? explain how Diaz Leon deals with this? Yes, I will. So the, the, what she does is she changes the focus of the contextualism. So it goes from what determines the, the, the standards in the context, because you know the definition says according to the standards at work and see. What determines the standards? So in Saul's proposal, what is called attributor contextualism, it's the community or it's the speaker. But in speak in subject contextualism, it's the actual normative facts in the ground, especially including, like I said earlier, that includes um, practical facts, it includes political facts, it even includes aesthetic facts, but over and above all else, it includes moral facts. And so the moral fact that misgendering is wrong grounds the fact that Verity is a woman. Because of the fact that that is in this con when you're using the word in this context. The, sub, the subject, not the speakers of the community, the subject is Verity. And Verity is a single person, not an aggregate, that's very important as I'm going to get to. That not, she's, not an, she's not an aggregate of people. And um, she, is a, she is a trans woman. And so because of that, I think that it is because of the moral facts that make in this context, it is true in any community, for any speaker, anywhere, that Verity is a woman. So... Um... I will just because those things can change, but the subject remains constant. The subject is verity. Uh, I just want to quote from the the article here. So, um, sure. So she says we no longer have to accept the claim. Uh, um, she uses the word Charla, the name Charla. I'm going to change it to verity. Yes, Charla. Uh, 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 we no longer have to accept the claim that utterances of verity is not a woman by trans misogynist speakers will be trivially true because it is just not true that what matters in, in Verity's context, when there is a discussion about whether she should be allowed to use women's bathrooms, say, is whether she has a vagina. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, it, 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 so, so the assumption is, is that um, 
okay, there are just like, uh, there are certain facts about what matters for verity. It, so like, so is it, so verity is what creates the context here. Um, so yes, I might, I might not be putting that very well, but uh, that's the thought, right? And then there are facts about what yes. matters in that context. Yes, normative facts. And so those facts determine facts what count as as, as, um, uh, as so what count as being like the features that count as relevantly. So we, we want uh, exactly. Verity to be a woman if she has uh, relevantly similar features to those who possess the biological markers of female sex. And then yes. it's the normative facts that fix that. Um, yep. Yeah. OK. I mean, so is so c can we uh, frame this in a way that's acceptable to people like me who just want to reject normative facts across the board? <laughs> you know. uh, actually, I was thinking about this, and there is there is an appropriate answer for it, which is okay. Dan Zeman did a paper called um, it's called let me look this up title so I get this right. Uh, the title from Phil Papers. I get the citations correctly. Yes, it's called Invariantist Contextualist and Relativist Accounts of Gender Terms by Dan Zeman, 2020. So um, Zeman has a very similar view. So he allows for a kind of um, quasi-realist, uh, kind of quasi the contextualist account which is rel with relativism. And so what he does is to make your account, to make it work for people like you, you know, uh, for um, for people who are just not enlightened enough to understand that there are moral facts, <laughs> people who are, you know, um, uh, the virgin moral anti-realists, um, what we have to do is add in a second context. So um, we have, let me, let me read off the Zeman account, because I think that the Zeman account is actually kind of like Diaz Leon's, but works under like even error theory. Um, Okay, let me let me get it. Let me get because um, he talks about all these different different views, and he, he has his, his own proposal. Okay, yes. So um, he says that what he calls G. So G is his example gender statement, and G in this paper is the statement John is a man, where John is a trans man who's not undergone gender affirming medical procedures. Um, so his proposal is. G is not endorsing, but he considers it. He says, G is true as uttered in C sub U. So C sub U here is the context of utterance. And assessed in C sub A, the context of assessment, if and only if John counts as a man in C sub A. So C sub A, the context of assessment, that's like your brain. That's like your mind, where you are assessing that phrase as if it's true and not according to your values. And so what matters is... So there's like different contexts for when the phrase Verity is a woman, as our example, um, is uttered. It's uttered in different places. And that can change the that can change whether it's true or not, according to, to Zeman. But what determines that, the truth maker, like what, what makes that statement true, is the context of assessment. It's your personal opinions. So this is relativist. It's relativist to different observers. So what that means is that means that let me give an example of me, of uh, me and uh, Matt Walsh. So what that means is, if Zeman is correct, then the statement "Verity is a woman" is um, it's true for me. It's true for me when I say it, and um, uh, when Walsh says "Verity is not a woman," that's false for me. But um, from Walsh's point of view, when I say "Verity is a woman," that's false for him, and when he says "Verity is not a woman," that's true for him. So it's like, it's, it's sort of like truth for me, but not for you. It's like the cliche, you know, freshman relativist. That's what Zeman is proposing here. Um, and I think, I don't like this account, but I think that you might love it. <laughs> it's uh, perfect for you, but it's I find it to be not in my taste. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I did have a, another um, question about this, this contextualist sure. proposal, right? So um, mm -hmm. I can imagine somebody saying, well, you know, so uh, Diaz Leon has said, look, you know, it's it's just not true that what matters in Verity's context is is whether she has a vagina. And I can imagine um, a, a viewers objecting to this and saying, well, you know, wait a minute, though. I mean, there are going to be all sorts of situations where like um, the sort of 
things that we might think of as as being more associated with biological sex actually do matter i mean so i mean obviously there's like okay, let me explain you how i see this um but then there's also uh, uh i mean there's also like things like you know if i'm experiencing body dysmorphia say then like it's it seems like the fact that i have so if verity is experiencing body dysmorphia then the fact that verity has certain features that are more commonly associated with the male sex is something that matters to her. Um, do you see what I'm saying? I just see what you're saying. So here's the yeah. way I see it. So I see it differently than, than, than Diaz Leon does in this issue. This is kind of where I, you know, go in my own direction, but I agree with the general framework. What I do is different. So I believe that gender identity, because of three different factors, so Number one is the wrong of misgendering. I think of, I consider misgendering to be um, a person, a, a serious personal harm. Um, two, because of the good of affirmation, I think affirming someone's, someone's gender identity is an, is an important good. And those two um, things are distinct. Can you, can you, sorry, can you just repeat the, uh, the second one again? I, I kind of missed. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Um, so the second thing is the joy of affirmation. So there's a certain like, it's a, in the same way that misgendering is a wrong, I think that affirmation is an important is an important good. Um, it is a morally important good at the same time. And third is the accidental the accidental significance of identity to understand to understanding a person. And so these three things all combine. You've got like the you got like the pain of misgendering, the pleasure of of uh, affirmative gendering, and the sort of like understanding a knowledge of the person. These two things come together and they make a powerful case prima facie for gender identity with a relevant standard in, in any particular context. And so because of that, it's the default, it's the norm to use gender identity for the descriptor, unless there is a reason to override it. And I believe that is the case in some specific cases, which I can talk about. I think that in some contexts, it is appropriate to override gender identity. Um, I can tell you what some of them are, if, if you're interested. Uh, I mean, yeah, go, I go think ahead. That, <laughs> gender identity is, I think, prima facie. So I think that it's like, so in 2022, she did a follow-up paper where she says that Diaz Leon says that we have what she calls protanto reason to use gender identity, saying very similar reasons. I go further. I go from protanto to prima facie. So I'm stronger than her on that. But we have, this, we have a similar idea here. I'm inspired by her. Um, so I think even in medical context, I think an identity still holds in medical context. That's why I actually support inclusive language like saying, you know, people with uteri instead of women, instead of women, um, because the fact that I think identity still holds. So there are a few contexts where I think where it doesn't, and I'll discuss them. The first one comes from Elizabeth Barnes again. Barnes did a paper published in the journal Mind um, called, I'm going to give the title, it's called Gender Without Gender Identity, um, the Gifts of Cognitive Disability. So Barnes points out that there are some people who are cognitively disabled, and so don't have, you know, couldn't possibly have a Jenkinsian identity or any other kind of identity you, you could think of. But yet it's still important for them to be considered women, you know, I mean, assuming that they are, assuming that they are assigned female at birth. Because of the fact that violence against them is still important to violence, violence against women. We see that as like, it should be a feminist concern to protect them from sexual violence. And so because of that, I, th I agree. I think it's, in that case, I think because of feminist concerns, it is actually overrides the identity. Uh, and so, if we're identity only, then that to be considered a gender or non-binary. But you know, because uh, of the feminist issues here, I think that they become they are considered women. Um, it's relevant in that context. Another example is for an individual person is telling people telling their own stories. And what I'm, what do I mean by that? Well, some trans people, I actually am in this first group. Some trans people uh, disagree about a certain thing, which is. Before transition, were you your identified gender or were you not? In other words, like, did you change genders or were you always the same gender? And people disagree on this. So some people like me say I was always the same gender. I see it as I was always, I see it as like I was always a girl slash woman, but I just didn't really know back back then. Um, I wasn't really aware of it. I didn't really accept it. That's sort of like how I think of myself. But some will disagree with that. Some people will say, no, I really was. You know, like there are trans men who are like, I really was a girl, or there are, I know trans women who are like, I really was a boy. Um, and so because of that, I think that in this case, when talking about their past selves, because of how they see themselves, it is relevant to use not their identities, which I think, I'm guessing that their identities actually didn't change in a Jenkinsian sense, because like their quality didn't suddenly shift. Like they were, I'm assuming that they were always there, but because of the fact that they were more important, that more important to them was their social class, 
you know, I'm going to say that in those cases, it's permissible to say, yes, you know, S was a man and became a woman. And that's, that's what they tell their own story. Or S was a woman and, be, S was a woman and became a man. That's their second case where it's okay to not use a gender identity. Um, to tell evil stories. So then we've got the dis disabilities, telling stories, um, and uh, um, can this I just, sort of leads uh, up to the really good clarify one. something um, about that second case because that second uh, sure. case sounds like uh, it sounds like you are just using the state of gender identity. Maybe I'm confused about something here. No, because but, I see identity yeah. as not a belief, but I see identity. I see identity no matter no matter what you, you think of it as. I fundamentally think of it as a kind of qualia. And so because of that, and because of the science showing that it starts forming as early as age three, when people say that, um, like, they feel as though they actually change genders, I don't, I'm going to assume that their identity didn't actually change, but what, what actually, what they think of it as is, like, what's more important to them is how they change socially. And so because of that, I think that we should privilege um, class when describing their past selves because it fits their narratives. That's sort of how I, that's how I interpret it. But um, both of those concerns are sort of like secondary to the real one, the reason why this really is important, why I'm a contextualist, and that is feminism and politics. Because I have been just, that's why I emphasized earlier with Verity how important it is that Verity is a single person, not an aggregate. Because I think that when you start talking about aggregates, we're going to mean women as a class or men as a class. Then they become a lot of reasons why you, it's okay to use it's okay to use sex or gender class terms when appropriate. Um, and a big case of when this is appropriate, I think abortion. Um, I got this view after the fallout with Donald D. Jackson in the United States um, because of the fact that while I, okay, I think these two things are both true. Number one, I think that it's appropriate to use in medical contexts. Um, case things like pregnant people. That's totally fine because you want to be able to make all of your you want to be able to make all your patients comfortable, you know. And so because of that, the identity standard is applied. You know, the identity standard is important in this medical context because you're trying to make you know you're trying to respect your patients, et cetera, et cetera. But in the political context, it's important to say Donald was an attack on women. It's a women's rights issue, and I think that's unintelligible unless you think of it as a sex term. And so like. In a perfect world, we shouldn't have to do this. As much as possible, we should try to affirm, you know, trans men because because they are because they are valid and other and other like, you know, AFAP people who are non-binary perhaps. Um, but they're all valid. You know, I'm not saying that they're not valid, but there is a political need to use the words to use the word women when talking about this, and there is a political need to say this is the domination of women by men and. So I want to show you an example of this. I had this view for a while, and I was like not sure about it. But I have a brilliant example of why this is true. A book came out recently called Ejaculate Responsibly. <laughs> I know it's like a bit of a you know, probably a title, I guess. But so it's a really interesting book. I just, from what I can see, it looks really cool. Um, and the author makes the argument she's trying to shift the blame from abortion to, from women to men. Her argument is that abortion isn't a women's issue at all. It's actually it's all men's fault because, as she argues, quote. Men are responsible for all uh, for all unplanned pregnancies. Now you'll notice that throughout the entire book, she uses the, she says like it's the men, it's the men, and she talks about men clearly as a, as a sex class. And in fact, here's the thing: at the very beginning of the book, she has a note on language, and she says that she respects trans people, she's an ally of the LGBTQ community, but she says for this particular issue, transgressive language is not appropriate. And I was like, yes, I love the way that she said that because she clarified like. In this book, I'm using the word men to mean specifically people people who can people who can ejaculate sperm, and by women I mean people who can get pregnant. That's what I mean with these terms. Because like, if you're a man and you can't you know get women pregnant, then this isn't talking about you. You know, it, it's like you're not the problem here. You know, so that's where it's very important politically that you'll be able to do that. You know, for for causing change. It is one more off the tongue if you can say things like, you know, oh, it's uh, people with penises are um, by generally oppressing people with uteri or whatever. It's like that doesn't, it's, it's, that's not really appropriate for this con. You, you have to take into account the political concerns. Um, and so this is where um, I actually had to tone down a paragraph in my original paper because it was seen as too turfy <laughs> because I expressed agreement. I expressed, um, I expressed, a degree of agreement with some comments made earlier this year, and I was writing it by Bette Midler, who is accusing um, trans people of women of erasing women. 
And I was like, first off, this is transphobic, you know. I'm not trying. We're not trying to erase anyone. We're just trying to be ourselves, you know. But I was saying that they have a bit of a she has a bit of a point here when she talks about the importance of women as political class being something that is. Um, something that is appropriate and sometimes to use a sex term like it's important i think that protesters you know say things like if men can get pregnant we wouldn't be here even though men can get pregnant that is i agree with that in a when you say that when you say the phrase men can get pregnant in like a general context i think that's where identity takes over and the answer is yes but it's still important politically like at a rally or at a protest to be able to say things like if men can get pregnant we wouldn't be here because it's still trying to say something very important and so in the aggregate case, I think it's more often permissible to use it as a sex or gender class term. Gender class, for example, talking about discrimination against women in the workforce. You know, discrimination against women, that's not discrimination against, you know, um, like people with certain qualia. That's discrimination against people who present a certain way, you know, because it presumably includes trans women as well. Um, but trans women who are like presenting as female, you know, because um, if you've got like let's say um that you've got um like a male ceo um who is a closet trans woman by the way this actually happened several times a lot of um there actually have been several ceos who came out as trans women i think one of them is martine rothblatt um another one is i think maybe jennifer pritzker but i don't know what her title is in the inner company but anyways let's say you've got somebody like that and then like but like they're a closet trans woman they don't tell anyone about their identity and so if you're a feminist and you want to end discrimination against women in the workforce um, obviously, in that, in that context, you're going to be talking about it as a gender class term. So you've got similar cases like this. Now, very important here, what I'm not saying is feminism should exclude trans women. Not at all. Not, not in the slightest. Because once again, I think in general, it's, it's an identity term. It should be used as an identity term. Um, what I'm saying is that there are particular cases where there are overriding concerns that make it the case so that women becomes a sex or gender class term. And so going back to the thing with Walsh. Um, when the protesters, the protesters were out, the protesters who were outside um, the lobby were here speaking, chanting various things like "trans rights are human rights," which I would totally agree with. But something else they chanted was "trans women are women," and I agree with that too. But I interpret it differently than they do because I see that sentence as a generalization. I see it as saying, like, in the vast majority of cases, you know, and for the most part, trans women are women. But I think there are a few exceptions. Um, and that these exceptions take place in general because they are fully necessary in our in our you know broken world in our uh, imperfect world, and that like in an ideal world we shouldn't need to talk about these exceptions, but they kind of have to exist. Um, and importantly, like I said at the very beginning here, these are always about aggregates. These are always about aggregates. These are not about individual people. So. This is not saying, you know, um, like when the person, when um, the person has the sign and says, if men could get pregnant, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here, right? Now, when that person has that sign, they're not saying like, if my trans male friend, <laughs> they're not saying like, if my trans male friend, um, uh, Aiden, sorry, I'm being too stereotypical. <laughs> That's like a stereotype. <laughs> There's stereotypes of like trans men's names. It's one of them. If, if my, uh, let's use a different one then. If my trans male friend Evan could get pregnant, we wouldn't be here. Like, that's not okay because now you're actually misgendering someone. And then that, that becomes false then actually. Um, that becomes incorrect because now you're talking about it's a particular person. It has now changed. But like, there are times when the aggregates make this necessary. Um, and in all cases, it's for like, a specific reason. You know, I believe the humanism must include trans women because there are cases where, where we are oppressed qua women. And an example of this, I think, there's actually two, there's a good article about this by Katie Kirkland. It's I'm called sorry, Feminist just, Aims just and Trends. Uh, go, go in, into sorry. that. Am I talking to you fast? I'm sorry to talk uh, super uh, fast, aren't I? No, it's, it's not that you're talking too fast. I just wanted to. Um, uh, so, uh, just to clarify uh, what you were saying. So, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, I'm trying to be careful here, so you know that I'm like, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that we should be trans exclusionary at all. I'm not trying to make sure that I'm trying to make that very clear. Well, you, you, you'd said that in the vast majority of cases, in most contexts, right? Then, of course, trans women are women, right? But then there are yes. these specific contexts, like let's say we're talking the about abortion. Somebody holds up this yes. sign. Um, uh, but then I think, well, you know, so like going back to something like Diaz Leon's paper, the kind of Thing that she was talking about was a statement like verity is a woman right now yeah. obviously if we're talking about aggregates then we're just not i mean that that kind of statement is no longer relevant right so it wouldn't exactly be that so like if i say verity is a woman um it would be it seems like very strange to say well that becomes false in the context of talking about abortion 
Um, it doesn't. It doesn't become yeah. false in the context of talking about abortion. That's not what happens. So it remains true. Right. Yeah. So wh- what happens is when you say women as a when you say just women as a class, the meaning of the class women changes more frequently. Um. So, what mean as aggregate group? That women as aggregate changes in different contexts. Okay, but is, 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 is Verity part of that aggregate? <laughs> so, like, when when sometimes when, yes, sometimes no. Same with me. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But then, if Verity is not part of that aggregate, wouldn't it just be true to say that Verity is not a woman? I mean, in, in a context. Well, here's where the thing: there the is aggregate. no one single aggregate. There is no one aggregate because the aggregate itself, like. The aggregate changes in different contexts. There's times when the aggregate means identity. There's times when it means class. Times when it means sex. Um, and I think it, I think again because I'm a facey. I think it primarily means identity because of the fact that we have this overriding concerns, right? Okay, yeah. But that so, mentioned earlier. Let's and say so, that, that but there in, are times when it does not. So let's say we're in the context of like an abortion protest or something like that. Yes, um, that's when I think it. That's yeah. when it particularly shines out as a sex term to me. Right. So then, so but that, so then, Verity is not part of the class, and th- then it just seems like it is in fact going. So in that context, it will be true that Verity is not a woman. Here's the thing. This is where okay, I think that I think that you're correct, but at the same time, I think that if you, I think that if someone like. I think that um, if someone was like, like maybe the example I mentioned was like the if you had abortion protest, you said like, by the way, Verity is not a woman. <laughs> right. That seems like not the sort of thing. That's not the kind of political space that I'm talking about. So it becomes identity again. So well, yeah, okay, I guess so. in that context, it might be true, but like it could be true but unassertable. Okay, so it's another yes, one of those say. cases. It would be maybe a bit like uh, you know, if I'm at a funeral and uh, somebody starts talking about how you know the the deceased is. You know, looking down on us from from heaven, and then I stand up and I'm like, "What are you talking about? There's no such thing as heaven. They're gone. They're dead. They don't exist anymore." Um, well, that may be true, but uh, <laughs> exactly. And, it's, but, and, it's, and by the way, it's particularly because it's particularly because those things won't happen. Like, and most people will want somebody to say, "Like, oh yeah, Verity is not a woman." It's specifically because those things won't happen that makes it morally permissible. Because the fact that. And by the way, like as much as possible, we should we should try to include trans men because it really does affect them. I don't want to erase them. Um, these bands really do affect uh, trans masculine people um, and otherwise non-binary AFAC people. And we should include them as much as, much as as much as we can. Like we should as much as possible when trying to provide care, use this kind of language. I'm fully on board with using the phrase pregnant people, for example. That's totally fine. Um, I find the phrase birthing people to be a little weird because it sounds science fiction Like, ooh, are, are they birthing? That's kind of weird to me. So I guess you could say like people with uteri. That's totally fine as well. I, I'm okay with that. But like... There's a big difference for me between like in a medical context or in a con- or in a like or in a queer context, by the way, saying something like like people with uteri versus like at a protest, like you know, uh, like standing with people with uteri, you know, it's, it's, that's like no, you know, it's it's like there's there's something very different going on here, um, and so that's why in these sorts of narrow political contexts, it's gonna be important to, to maintain this word. Um, this does not mean that we should deliberately exclude anyone. This is for, so. This is for the purpose of political. This is the purpose of political speech and political action, not for the purposes of deliberate exclusion. You know, um, of either trans feminine or trans masculine people. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and obviously, well, well, I mean, it occurs uh, to me that um, so, with respect to something like abortion, right? I mean, there are plenty of cisgender women who cannot get pregnant. I'm exactly. Just wondering yes. They're it's... not part of that class either. They're not part of the right, class yeah, then. Yeah. 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 Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. Is that when I say woman is a sex term, there is no single feature that makes someone, uh, you know, uh, makes someone sex male or female. That's why I said it's assigned. It's assigned sex at birth. And so, as a sex term, it always means a particular characteristic. And in the case of abortion, it means the ability to get pregnant. So because of that, if we have a cis woman, you know, let's call her um, uh, Anna. And she can't get pregnant. When I, when someone says like, you know, justice for you know, support women's rights, support women had to choose. They're not. They actually does not include Anna, because in this context, because Anna can't get pregnant, it's not about her. 
Although, wouldn't um, that kind of unless on, on unless you could say she might she might be affected in like indirect way. Perhaps Anna um, needs medications, and that and those medications are seen as like abortifacents or something. Then maybe it could have Anna could be included. Um, but for the most part, uh, no. That means that like, and even if they totally says because they don't have this certain special characteristic that is the ability to get pregnant. It does seem to to me though that this is going to depend on how exactly we're sort of con we're, we're conceiving of the. Uh of the political program in question because i mean like i can so i can join a protest say uh to promote access to abortion but then i can conceive of that as just one specific instance of a more general promotion of body autonomy for example of course body autonomy is something that's relevant to absolutely everybody um so i i'm wondering then like i mean it, it does like is there a is there going to be a specific like what is the context then like if i'm if i'm uh if i'm if i'm arguing for abortion but for me that is uh part of a general program of body autonomy um then like how are we defining what counts as the context there because the context is like fem is feminist politics in particular that's why barnes mentioned this too i think i i think i don't remember exactly let me let me but i think she mentions in her paper the importance of like particularly because of the fact that because it's not a monolith, it's not like there isn't one thing, you know, like, like I said, there's sex and there's interclass, there's identity, etc. So because of that, feminism is trying to is trying to, you know, fight for women. And because those things I see it as a movement that try, that supports women and because these things generally overlap, it often doesn't really matter. It's often good to say identity. But because of the fact that in some cases it does not overlap. You know, we specifically mean women as identity or women as class or women as sex. Um, so identity, I want to give an example of that. So Katie Kirkland wrote a paper called Feminist Aims and a trans Definition of Women, in which she argued, like, why must feminism include trans women? Like, seriously, why? Why is it trans exclusive? And she answered why, and the answer is for two reasons. Number one is it has to be trans inclusive because of the effects on cis women, um, in particular because if they exclude trans women, then you have to start identity. You just have to start, like, policing people's appearance basically because you don't know who's you don't know who might be trans and not disclosing it right so you have to be like um you, you have to be suspicious of women who are masculine looking you know or uh who shave their heads or who are tall or both of those things you know it's like you have to start like um prioritizing certain appearances and those appearances by the way are often actually like um they're often kind of racist because um People, women of color are often are often like seen as more masculine sometimes, especially black women. I believe and this is a big problem. That's actually why this whole conspiracy, theory, like you know, this thing in the United States, it's really bizarre. People believe that Michelle Obama is a trans woman. It's it's insane, but it's because that she's a woman of color, she's a black woman, and so because that she's seen she is perceived as being masculine and aggressive, which are racist stereotypes. And so because of that, you know, that's by the way, that's why a lot of anti-queer feminists are white. You notice that they're almost all white, like. I did a photo recently of the LGB Alliance in the UK had a group photo at the, of this like comments that they had. Literally everyone was white. No, no people of color at all. Just a sea of white people. You know, and so like of, of course, right? Because I mean it's also because they don't really understand inter intersectionality. Because intersectionality is a big reason um, like white women and women of color often have different political goals, for example. The classic example of this is, is in the mid-20th century uh, it's in the late 20, mid to late 20th century, like the 70s and 80s, I believe. A big goal of feminism was because it was like white dominated was women in the workforce, get women in the workforce. But the thing was that black women and women of color in, in general were oftentimes already working to support their families and they wanted to be home with their, with, they wanted to be more home with their kids. And so it was like opposite goals. And so what had to happen was they had to make an intersectionality where it's like different classes of women often have different, often have different goals and interests, you know, but they're all unified in being women with a common struggle. And so that's often why the exclusion of feminists are almost always white, you know, because they don't really get intersectionality. Um, they see it like all they, they think of women as just white cis women. Um, not always the case, but usually it's, that's why they see them usually being white. Um, so, the other reason why it should be, it should be trans inclusive is because of the fact that trans women really are oppressed qua women. And the reason for this is she feels to Jenkins. This is why Jenkins is, is actually quite important to the way I think of feminism. Because according to Jenkins, trans women internalize these, you know, these sexist norms and expectations, you know, and roles. And so because of that, um, we are like inherently, um, we are sort of inherently oppressed because of that. 
You know, even if now it might not be that might not be the same impression as the system experiences, but it is a, it is necessarily a kind of impression. And now, obviously, though, I should I should add the fact that um, I should add that um, a trans women who pass as women, you know, or who are present in society are priced the same way as cis women are, like 100 percent the same way. That's obviously a case where you know it should be include it should include them because it's the same struggle, it's the exact same struggle. Um, but even the ones who are closeted is what she's trying to say. Kitty Kirkland is trying to say even the ones who are closeted are still a, or, or, who, or who are perceived as being men are still oppressed qua women because they still have these sexist expectations and norms, you know, within how they think of themselves. Like they still might, for example, I know this from experience, like even if they're not judged by women's, by women's body standards, by society, they must look at themselves in the mirror and be like, oh, I'm so ugly because they think of themselves as a woman. And so it's like they judge their body like a woman's body. And so like examples like that are why um, there really are cases where women's rights means women's or um, not women's rights, but like I think women's rights should be included as broadly as possible. But um, uh, where um, women's oppression, the oppression of women can actually be a, an identity category when you're talking about things like these expectations and norms, which actually has a lot of feminism fights against. So mm. like that's sort of why, even though there are some cases where um, Woman is, or women actually more precisely, where women is um, a sex term or a gender class term. There are other cases where importantly is an identity term, even within feminist practice. Like feminism should be trans inclusive, is what I'm trying to get at here. I'm, I'm trying to make, clarify that when I say things about um, women being a sex being, being a sex class or a gender or, or a gender class, um, that's not to say we should exclude trans women, not in the slightest. That's what I'm trying to explain here. Right. Or marginalized uh, trans men, as the same way, or marginalized trans men. We should, we should also should not try to um, erase or ignore um, as much as possible. We should try to not ignore the trans of trans men and like um, trans masculine and non-binary AFAB people. Sure, I, um, I feel like that. My, I, when when we were sort of talking about this, I uh, you know asked that question, "What is a woman?" And uh, of course, in the context of talking about trans issues, that's uh, I mean, oh yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I'm... it's like. <laughs> I mean, it's that's the question people ask, right? But it's like, wait a minute. It what is. About that's me? why I wanted guys. That's why I want to answer it. Yeah. Um, and I know I got a lot. I know I got long winded, but that's why I said the short answer is adult female human. Like that's the answer. If you want a short answer, that's the answer. But the long answer is, you know, female can be many different things. Yeah. Right. And it's about context. Um. So, okay. Look, I know that uh, we 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 spoke briefly about the sort of plan for the video i should say we're now coming up to two hours and so i was thinking oh, maybe, yeah. maybe maybe wrap it up um i would be very happy i mean if the, if you feel like there's more to talk about i'd be happy to do I mean, let me see because I, I, I had fun future. doing this i have always a good video oh sorry um, um so uh so i discussed the introductions discussed matt walsh um Ooh, I didn't discuss the current backlash, but that's sort of like another. I, I discussed um, what a woman is. I discussed sex and gender. Um, I discussed how it doesn't be trans inclusive. Um, okay, I did not discuss. Um, there's two things I didn't really discuss here, and so um, I guess one of them is like sort of was going to be my intro to this topic, which was I was going to talk about how there's a current backlash against trans rights, and it's because of the fact that. Um, you know, we're being visible, we're, we're more visible now, and so that always comes with a sort of backlash. There's like, we have gained rights, and we've gained recognition, and so people always get pissed about that when a minority group gets that sort of new rights and recognition, these sorts of like new rights, new found rights that they, you know, should have had. Um, but I think a reason why, the real question is like, you know, why did it happen? Oh, I, I'm, I'm getting on tangents here, but the thing about this backlash is that it mirrors almost exactly the backlash against gay rights. Like, almost word for word, point for point, it's the gay backlash. An example is the backlash against uh, gay people had this belief in what they called homosexual recruitment. So they believed that because gay people can't reproduce, they had to recruit people into homosexuality. They had to, you know, sort of molest children, and that's how they, they turn them gay, and that's how they get more gays. It's like that's how they, that's how they reproduce, you know. And so that was a really widespread belief. That's part of the gay backlash. And so here with the trans backlash, we see the exact same thing. Now we're groomers, you know, and that's what that's what it is now. It's the exact same, you know, lies. And it's like, oh, you have to groom kids into being trans. Um, and so that's where the question that I had was, why were they first? You know, why, why were why were the gays first? Why are we after them? And the reason is because of both prevalence. You know, they're more common. Also, I think conceptual confusion because of the fact that, like, when a trans woman like me says I'm a woman, people are like, "What are you talking about?" You know, that doesn't make any sense. Um, 
that's what I was going to segue from there. I was going to segue from that little discussion into uh, this. I was going to talk about like, okay, let's put up the concepts, you know. So hopefully we can address some of the things. Um, but uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about um, was women's sports. What's funny is that I wasn't actually going to talk about that at first, but as I was preparing for this interview, I was like, oh, I bet he's going to, I bet he's going to ask that. So I began researching for it. And I began with Wait, a ton of, about you it. So. I was did you? Sorry, you thought that I was going to ask about women's sports? Yes, I did. Oh, do you, do you know what my line on trans women in women's sports is? What is that? I don't know. What is it? I my line is that uh, sports is the most boring thing in the world. Um, <laughs> I agree. And, <laughs> I hate sports. I have no. I and 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 this is this is the part that's probably going to be controversial, but this is how I honestly feel. I think sports is the most boring thing in the world. I have no interest in it at all. I, I think it's like watching paint dry. I also think that as Same. far as I can tell, by the standards by which we judge athletes, the only reason why like women's sports exists is because we have this goal of like inclusion. I mean, like, so maybe not all of women's sports, right? But there's many cases where if we didn't have women's sports as a category, then you just wouldn't have any representation of women in sports. So like the whole point of having women's sports is to promote representation. Um, and so, I mean, look, uh, my, my take on this is, okay, I think sports is the most boring thing in the world. Women's sports is like the shit version of it that we only have because we're, <laughs> we're, we're no, trying to promote that. representation. And so if that's the goal, why the hell wouldn't we be trying to get trans people uh, out there as well and give them some representation? Anyway, that's it. That's my line on women's sports. I, w I wasn't planning on thing. asking about that. But uh... Here's the thing. So what's funny is I actually do, because I don't like sports either. I'd be like, you know, uh, Google.com, what is a sport? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know nothing about this. So I had to do a bunch of research. Um, and so... Basically, what you're saying is something. There's a there's a paper. I forget its name right now, but it was talking about. I think it's called like Beyond Fairness. Yes, it's called Beyond Fairness: The Ethics of Inclusion for Trans and Intersex Athletes by John Gleaves and Tim Lairback, 2016. Um, anyway, so this paper this this paper has a very similar view to what you just said, because it talks about you know why is there women's sports at all? Like why does it even exist? Not not like why do women play sports? Obviously, it's because they're athletes. But like why do we have a separate category? Why do we put them into a different category called women's sports? There is an example of belief that women need to be protected. You know, it's like women are a second, are, are a second class. You know, the, the men are so strong, you know, and they will never compete fairly. So they must be in their own separate group, you know. And so because of that, we get this belief of like, oh, men's sports is just called sports. Women's sports is called women's sports. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, there's basketball and there's women's basketball. You know, there's baseball and there's softball, stuff like that, where it's like the women is the inferior version. It's the shit version. Um, and so that's obviously bad from a feminist standpoint. And so, like, we should be asking ourselves, why even do we have a women's sports category? Why is it not inter why is it not unisex? And the answer is obviously because of sex differences. You know, there's like there really are sex differences in the, in, in uh, ability. But here's the thing: why not just do that? Like, instead of doing um, instead of doing it based on uh, these sex or gender categories, why not just do it based on ability? And we could have any number of categories. They're just men and women. We could, we'd have any num we could have any number that we wanted. Like, we could have, like, three categories or four categories. They could be different categories for each sport. But the idea is that we would do it based on ability. And so that way, there wouldn't even be an issue, you know, because there wouldn't even be an issue with, um, you know, like, oh, trans women don't, don't belong in this category. Because it's, like, it's not about sex or gender at all. It's about, it's about your body. It's about, your, like, your testosterone levels, you know, and your um, muscle fibers and um, the, your height and your, you know, body mass. And I don't know sports, man. <laughs> but <laughs> it would be about stuff like that. It would be about body characteristics. And it would get, like, collected into it, into, into a fact, into, like, collected into, like, a sort of algorithm, I guess. Um, that's pros in a different, different paper. It's like, there's a paper about it in 2019 that was like, um, let me find it. It's like, uh, trans sports 2019 paper. Okay. Look it up. Um, where is it? I can't find it. Um, is it, um, I can't find it. There's a paper from 2019 that talks about the idea of making an algorithm, basically, where we're, like, taking all these different variables and, and then, like, output some kind of, like, it would then output, like, a single number, I guess, and then um, you could then do cutoffs however you wanted. So, like, you could do, like, like I said, you can make, like, two groups or three books or three groups or four, and so you could get it however you wanted so that you got the right amount of competition and fun and whatnot. 
and there will be no bickering about who belongs in what to know category. Um, I mean, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, that sounds fine to me. I actually don't care. I'd be happy for sports to just, um, you know, just be completely destroyed by, you know, like it, that would be one of the benefits of us being destroyed. By <laughs> people, <laughs> so, yeah. What's funny is here's the thing that they don't get is people want to ban trans men from sports because they're like, you know, everyone's beating sports as their as their assigned gender at birth. You know what happens then? Because right now we've got trans women like winning some competitions and whatnot, you know, because HRT really does we really does weaken it, it lowers testosterone, you know, it, it weakens muscles, etc. If you had a trans field play as a sport they were assigned at birth, women's sports would be dominated by men. Both of being trans men, you know, because you would get literal men. You would get literal, you know, bearded, jacked up men winning every win sports competition possible, sweeping the board, because they're on fucking testosterone. I don't know if I get fair in this. You can bleep me out. They're on testosterone. It's, it's right. They're literally jacked up. Um, I actually, you know, this yeah. reminds me of, uh, I think that this has actually happened. I remember seeing it has something happened. about it already uh, has. It was somebody in, was, is it like MMA or something like that? And uh, and there were these like there was some transphobic Twitter account that was posting pictures of, um, I mean what it looked like is it looked like like a man beating up a woman right in in an MMA context and you know they were like you know this is what happens when you let trans women in in women's sports but then it turned out that this uh, that this trans woman was actually a trans man uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, so it was like yes. they're actually. By, by the transphobic person. It's like, that's what you want. They're both, they're both, they're both women, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's why it's so ironic because, like, literally, they all, like, ignore trans men. And that's why it's like the... They say things like, no men in women's bathrooms. It's like, that's what you want. You want men in women's bathrooms because you want trans men to be there. You know? It's like, you don't realize that, you know, some people who are assigned female at birth are men, you know, and they're going to, and they're going to be, like literally men right <laughs> so like in sports that happened once there's a wrestler named, named andy biggs who i think he's a he was a trans boy he was like a high school wrestler and of course he dominated women's wrestling but literally what happened was because he's because he's a trans boy he was on testosterone and so at the end of it he was like i shouldn't he, he was you know he was the winner he won the competition and he was like i shouldn't be the winner because i should be competing in the men's category but these kinds of rules say that i can't and it's like it was literally the example of like the this is a literal boy dominating girl sports because he's trans. Yeah, what what exactly is the uh, solution to this issue? I, I mean, I'm I'm not really that familiar. It just with, uh, I think with it is. This, like, ability with these, like, turfy communities, but um, like, what do they say? Because they must have encountered this problem. Like, what what would they say about? So trans men in women's bathrooms and okay, here's a common thing I hear. They commonly school. say so they commonly advocate for what they call third spaces. So they say like they said they solve a lot of different issues. They believe there should be like a men's thing, a women's thing, and then like a trans thing because they see us as being like a third gender. So um, for this for, um, here, it would be like I've seen like suggestions that there'd be like a trans category. I'd be like two or three people, though. It wouldn't be very many people, especially in youth sports. They'd be like, what, like one person or two people? You know, and, and so it's like, that's just not going to work. You're just going to get like lots of people in women's sports, lots of people in men's sports. And then like for trans sports, you get like four people or whatever. And you get like a tiny crowd. It would just be like, uh, yeah, I just, um, it's just a horrible idea. That's what they often propose explain it when they understand this the ones who get the ones who get this i see yeah okay um so uh look i i think that's everything that i i think it is yeah i think we talked about everything i'm covering time. right um is there anything you uh, just want to say to wrap it up if not that's fine uh, yeah sure uh, so um <laughs> wrapping it up uh it's probably going to be a long video <laughs> so uh, in that case i um I hope you enjoyed listening, I guess. Uh, I hope that I didn't talk too fast to be, you know, misunderstood, I mean, to be understood. I did it again. Um, I hope I was a good enough speaker. And uh, um, what else? What can I say to close this off? I don't really think of, I don't, I don't really have any big, like, no, conclusion, right. I guess. You don't, you don't have to say anything. It's it's fine. We can just uh, end, it, end it there. I can say. End it there, yeah. Uh, thank you for watching. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, everybody. And...
goodbye. <laughs>